Uh, this is Kevin McKernan, and I, um, I'm obsessed with genomics, and lately it's been cannabis genomics, at least since uh, probably nine years now, since 2011. Hey, everybody. This is Jason Wilson with the Curious About Cannabis podcast. Thanks so much for tuning in once again. Uh, so, today, so today I'm really, really stoked to have on a guest I've been sort of casually following for years and I've been wanting to connect with for a long time. I'm with Kevin McKernan with Medicinal Genomics. Thanks so much, Kevin, for being willing to come on the podcast. Thanks for having me, Jason. I've uh, really enjoyed all the guests you've had so far. So it's been a, it's a great podcast you've got going. Oh, thank you so much. I appreciate that. And I look forward to having you right in there with everyone else that I've been speaking with. And um, today we're going to talk about um, a topic that I haven't touched in any other interview, um, primarily because it gets into an area where there aren't a ton of people doing this work, but we're going to talk about uh, cannabis genetics and genomics and microbiology primarily. Um, and so, Kevin, for those listeners that uh, maybe are not familiar with you and your work, can you briefly describe some of your academic and professional background leading up into um, your founding of medicinal genomics and the work that you're doing there? Oh, sure. So I started off my uh, genomics career at uh, the Whitehead Institute back at uh, MIT. Uh, so this is a center in Cambridge that was sequencing the human genome and uh, was part of an international effort to sequence uh, the human genome along with the, the Sanger Center and a few folks in, uh, in, in Japan and Europe. Uh, that was uh, from 96 to 2000, and I was managing their research and development team there. Uh, so we built a lot of the robotics that... Um, that uh, automated the DNA purification and, and got the, um, the sequencing running there. And in 2000, uh, when that project was coming to a close, I decided to spin out a few of the patents that we had uh, acquired at the time there into a company called um, Agincourt. And this was a DNA sequencing, a private entity that was a DNA sequencing provider for a lot of people in the, in the pharmaceutical and healthcare space. Uh, but we also sold um, DNA purification tools that help people um, extract DNA out of cells. Um, and fast forward to 2011, um, seven years in that, in that time frame, the company also built a, a DNA sequencer known as a solid sequencer that eventually went to market under, um, under applied biosystems. They were the, mm. for those in the sequencing field, um, they probably know of maybe two companies that have had fairly large market shares throughout the history of DNA sequencing. And ABI was the first one. They had all these Sanger sequencers and, and, uh, they have, um, they're still in the market and they still do their thing under the Thermo name, uh, but there's uh, now Illumina, who's a very large contender mm -hmm. and ar arguably um, a, a larger entity now. And we were competing with Illumina with uh, the solid sequencer for a period of about five years. Um, and then uh, in around 2011, I decided to just do something different and, and get out of the industry and go, and go into the plant genetic space. And we began sequencing cannabis genomes back in 2011, mm -hmm. um, flew over to Amsterdam and uh, extracted a bunch of samples over there, met Don and Aaron from DNA Genetics and Dave Watson and a bunch of other, uh, Robert Clark, a bunch mm -hmm. of other folks showed me around over there. Um, and uh, we really didn't know what to do with it at the time. We just knew that genomics helped so many other markets. It was bound to help this one, but we had no idea what to do with the information and how to turn it into a company. Um, so we kind of explored a little bit. Um, and uh, I'd say it was a very slow start with medicinal genomics because we were a company that was embedded inside of a clinical diagnostic company known as Cortigen. Mm -hmm. And um, most of the company's efforts were sequencing kids with epilepsy and mitochondrial disease and arguably a lot of diseases that center around the ECS. Uh, although the people in the clinical sequencing space probably don't know what the ECS is yet. Right. Um, they're, um, as you've probably heard from many of the guests you've had before, it's not really taught in medical school. Uh, so that was a, an interesting business, but a very challenging one, because as insurance companies moved into the space after the AMA, they didn't like this idea of sequencing for uh, idiosyncratic diseases, um, diseases we don't really understand. Yeah. We don't want to reimburse for that. And so uh, they started raising people's deductibles and making that type of sequencing very difficult for people to do. Um, and that's when we decided to shift the company fully into sequencing cannabis genomes, because we saw, ironically, less headwinds, <laughs> regulatory headwinds in the cannabis space than in the clinical sequencing space. So um, if that gives you any sense of the right. background, I've, I've wandered from research sequencing to clinical sequencing all the way into what people might call recreational sequencing, <laughs> uh, but always has DNA in the thread. And what is it about uh, working with genetics and studying DNA that that really draws you in that you that you find really interesting well 
personally, I like the fact that it reveals how different everybody really is. Mm. Uh, I mean, we have this societal tendency to want to group people into uh, into either races or or, or sexes or, or or these other large categories and treat the entire population as one. And w- what we're learning from the Human Genome Project is that is incredibly stupid. <laughs> uh, everybody's very, very different and unique, and personalized medicine is clearly the way to go. Uh, and it's just taking time um, to sort of fight the system, to make the system aware of the fact that you're not going to have an algorithm to apply to a population. You're going to need to have physicians actually speak to patients uh, and ascertain that individual's needs. Um, so that, I don't know, that, that has always been uh, appealing to me is I, I generally don't like one size fits all principles. Like yeah. they're, they're just grotesque. And, um, uh, and there's a tremendous amount of potential in sequencing people's genomes and, and improving, improving healthcare. Uh, now that, that same story really resonates in cannabis because you get involved mm-hmm. in, in cannabis genomes and you realize they're even more different than people are. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. And uh, this concept of a, sativa or a hybrid or an indica is is garbage Uh, (laughs) yes i'm glad to hear you say that uh, and so we have to change that if we particularly if we want the medical uh, system to start to speak this language Mm -hmm. um they're not going to prescribe green crack to somebody Uh, you know it's (laughs) it's it's, it's, they're going to want to know terpene profiles maybe even a genotype because there's a lot of dark pharmacology as you heard um yep spoken about before uh, the, the chemotypes are great, but they only measure maybe a dozen compounds, and we know there's thousands. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so the genomics is another cheap way of getting at that information. Uh, and I think the other thing that's really exciting about the genomics field is there probably isn't a field out there that's moving at a faster pace. Uh, mm-hmm. When when you start looking at the cost declines in DNA sequencing, we've never seen anything like this before. And, and any it, even in the even in the chip market where you hear about Moore's right. law, and and Moore's law is slow. It's mm-hmm. actually something that kind of gets laughed at in the sequencing space because we're always held back by the fact that the chips aren't fast enough. Yeah. Um, and the sequencers are moving at a faster pace than uh, than the semiconductor improvements are. So it's a um, it's one of those fields that forces you to learn about um, DNA storage, inf- you know, data storage information, whether that be in DNA or not in DNA storage. Uh, it, you have to learn about hard drives. You have to learn about internet bandwidth. You have to learn about chemistry required to sequence these things. So it's very, um, you can't get bored in this space. Yeah, yeah. Man, there's several things you've touched on that like spark passions inside of me as well. I mean, one, um, like I mentioned before we started the interview, part of my background is in IT and <clears throat> even in um you know, chemistry labs that I've worked in, a lot of times I end up becoming the technologist because I'm very interested in the equipment as well and, and the idea yeah. of information. And so one thing about genetics that interests me, but I'm so um, deficient in my like formal training with genetics, but just the idea of how information is stored, transmitted, you know, in these ways that are not necessarily intuitive. Um, but then also what you just touched on is something that several clinicians that I've interviewed have talked about is this move towards um, what's sometimes called in of one medicine or um, yeah, individualized medicine, trying to figure out how to use that genetic data to understand what a patient is sort of bringing to the table um, before going in to prescribe certain treatments and everything so that you can narrow down um, with, with much more confidence what might be more likely to work. Yeah, and I think it's really important. We, we learned this in the epilepsy field that um, sequencing and understanding the patient's genome can, can, can save lives. I mean, there are certain mutations in, um, in epilepsy that just require vitamin supplementation and yeah. the seizures go away. And uh, that can often get in the way. Um, you might put them in CBD and not notice that for six mm-hmm. months and, and then they end up honeymooning out of it. And it really turns out they just actually needed vitamin B6 or B12 or folic acid or... Yeah. Uh, they need to be on a ketogenic diet because they have glucose transport mutations. There's a host of, mm-hmm. there's at least like 24 different forms of genetic epilepsy that are actionable based on the genome itself. And they may not always lead you into benzos or cannabinoids. They might lead yes. you in the path that doesn't even involve these, um, these compounds. So um, we think it's very, very valuable. It, the, the challenge is um, cannabinoids right now sit in this really weird legal conundrum where mm-hmm. it's difficult for doctors to prescribe them. It's even more difficult for you to have a genetic test that actually tries to look at the variants and make informed decisions on which cannabinoids to potentially use or if to use mm-hmm. them at all, because there's a lot of um, 
there's a lot of FDA scrutiny on direct-to-consumer genetics. Right. There shouldn't be, but there is. Um, they don't like having patients enabled to make intelligent decisions. They want that all to be channeled through the FDA-appointed medical school doctors, and that doesn't scale. Um, it's important that physicians obviously are very well trained and know what they're doing, but um, the, the better thing is to make sure all the patients uh, begin to take, pay very close attention to their health because there is no one who is more vested in the outcome mm -hmm. of their health than the individual. And arming them with information, in my mind, is always a good thing. But um, they don't see it that way yet. And uh, so they have been cracking down a lot of companies that do direct-to-consumer genetics if they ever imply that they're um, going to be used for medical decisions. Uh, 23andMe was one case of this where they just got um, they got hammered by the FDA and they kind of sent a signal through, through, the, uh, through the, the field that if you do any of this without going through the FDA, mm -hmm. we're going to come down on you. So um, we, we, for a while, we're, we're looking at panels that would genotype patients and try to discern you know, whether they had like an MTHR mutation and they should go one direction or whether they had variants that might predispose them to opiate uh, addiction, because there, there are some known that, that mm -hmm. increase your likelihood of opiate addiction and that it might be, um, that might coach you in the direction of cannabinoids. But um, I think the sequencing needs to get a lot cheaper uh, for that yeah. to happen, because right now it's probably a couple hundred dollars is probably might be better spent going to a dispensary and just experimenting with different CBD and THC ratios until you find something that actually works because mm -hmm. the, the science we have around the genotypes is still, um, it's, I wouldn't say it's fuzzy, but it's still, it's early. It's, it's very early correlating these genotypes to, um, to, to outcomes. Well, that's, that's exactly what I, um, where my mind was going next. I know that one of the, the limitations currently with some of the genomic research on humans is just trying to understand how to interpret the data that's there and how to correlate it to, um, you know, very specific things. And something that I think we'll get into in a little bit when we talk about cannabis is that genetics can be very tricky in that you can think you have the full picture of uh, what genes and, you know, what correlating enzymes and things are responsible for trickling out into certain effects. And then you realize the picture is more complicated um, than you initially thought. And there's more involved, more genes or, um, or even novel yes. mechanisms that you weren't even aware of. It's very true. It's an onion. When you keep, as you dig mm -hmm. into the genetics, you realize there's just there's many more layers to the data from the transcriptomics, the proteomics, to all the, the methylation that's going on. So it is a, it, it can in fact be um, a rabbit hole mm -hmm. in that regard. But um, on the bright side, um, this is a plant that's largely not been studied yet. And right. when you look back over the last 20 years where they have applied genetics to plants, the productivity gains are just massive. Uh -huh. um, they've just the agricultural revolution that's happened is is is, is clear as day now that they, since they sequenced the rice genome and the wheat genome, you can right. see the number of, of traits that they're starting to discover and how they can use that to breed for more efficiency. Um, it's it's something when you when you see those papers, you you start to recognize that like the carrying capacity of the planet isn't as limited as we might think. Yes, uh, that we are going to get more and more effective at uh, at, at at biology. And, and how we as humans fit into that biology in a way that isn't as wasteful as it is today. Yeah, exactly. I mean, something that comes to mind is like, um, you know, in the classic story and movie Jurassic Park, or uh, the idea that life finds a way, you know, st right, studying, right. studying these things helps you understand how life is so adaptive and able to, um, you know, reveal different traits that you never would have imagined might have been you know, possible, um, in order to, you know, continue persisting throughout time. And it's interesting to see humans role in that. I think, um, something that I think about a lot, um, you know, sometimes people have a tendency to talk about humans as if they're outside of nature. Or, right. Yeah. And, yeah. and, you know, in the sense of this work, it's, you know, I don't think of it that way at all. Like we are, we are part of nature. We are part of how life is unfolding and, and interacting with itself. And so in this, in this funny way, you know, people studying genomics, doing this work, unlocking these tools and understanding how to be more conscious in how we influence life and that sort of thing. It's right, interesting. Right. It's like mother nature doing these things, you know, through itself, um, but using humans as a tool um, to this. Meeting. It is. Does bring up a lot of um, 
controversy, right? In terms yeah. of GMO and, and yeah. should we be, should we be, are we part of nature when we start modifying nature and, and, um, is this analogous to beavers building dams and bees building beehives right. and all the other tool builders out there? Uh, are we meant to utilize our intellect to do this to nature? And, and that's, uh, um, that's a deep topic that can go on for days. But um, my, my general sense on it is there's, there's multiple different ways one can be uh, performing GMO. I mean, arguably mm -hmm. Mendel was doing GMO. Right. He was genetic, genetically directing a breeding program. Uh, and we can do that today too, but even at a faster pace because mm -hmm. we have basically better measurements. We're not just looking at maybe the color of the peas. We're actually looking at the cannabinoids, which you can't mm -hmm. see with your eyes, or you're looking at the genes that encode them so that you can track these things at a much faster pace. But I think we're also going to be confronted in the next few years with how does the community feel about removing genes from the genome? Mm -hmm. Actually, adding any foreign content, but maybe it's important that we delete a couple um, rare cannabinoids so we can comply with the USDA's hemp laws. Right. Uh, right. There are some leaky cannabinoid synthase genes in the genome, and some of them you can get rid of, some of them you can't, depending on what your goals are. Um, and I've seen rumors and maybe even a couple patent applications implying some people have gone about deleting uh, mm -hmm. at least THC synthase. Um, I don't think you need GMO to do that because you can find plenty of plants that don't right. have it and just breed for it. But let's say it was some other gene you wanted to get rid of. Um, I think that's going to kind of come our way. I think the other thing we're going to see are people who are trying to be very cognizant of the fact that GMO has a marketing problem right now, uh, that they're going to try to do manipulations with the plant's own genes. They're going to maybe take the, chlor take the chloroplast genome and add stuff to it because the chloroplast genome sits at extraordinarily high copy number and you might get more expression putting certain genes there. Um, there's other people who have thought about putting other markers on the Y chromosome mm -hmm. as well. So you can find males from a drone flight. And, um, oh, interesting. That's, yeah. that's probably going to require a foreign gene. I don't know of a gene in cannabis offhand that might, in fact, do produce that marker. But someone, the obvious one is uh, green fluorescent protein, which was pulled out of a jellyfish. Um, that's used to mark all types of other transgenic plants. And uh, you could pop that into the Y chromosome and have your plants glow in a certain wavelength such that a drone flight could identify males and rip them out. And those males presumably won't propagate if you're good at removing them. But there's always a risk that they'll make pollen that, that could spread. Mm -hmm. And then there's a property rights issue as to who, you know, did you, did you get your pollen into my field and who's responsible for that? And um, with all of these modifications, uh, that also tends to bring the elephant into the room, which is patent rights. Um, it's easier to get patent rights on things that are clearly man modified than things that have been naturally bred. Um, there are breeders' rights, there are plant patents, and there are utility patents, which we're seeing roll out right now, and they can cover naturally occurring plants, uh, but it's far easier to get something through the patent office if you've clearly changed it from nature. Um, I don't necessarily agree with that moral philosophy, but yeah. that's the facts of the matter. That's what we have. Um, so I, I think we're going to be faced with a lot of these things sooner than we realize. If you actually go through the patent office today, you will find patents in there for, that have cannabis in there where they have put glyphosate resistance into them. They have put uh, human P450s into them to modify cannabinoids so that they are more water soluble upon extraction. Mm. Uh, there have been ones that um, I suspect they're going to be ones working on C3 to C4 photosynthesis conversions. And uh, there, there's a host of these mods that are already in the patent office. This doesn't mean the technology works yet. Right. Patents have no obligation to work. Uh, <laughs> there's anti-gravity devices out there, right? They're just ideas. But um, usually people don't file those unless there's some preliminary data because the expense of filing isn't something you just do on a, on a, a brain fart. Yeah. You actually want to make sure it's worth calling the lawyers for. So um, I know I see a wave of all of this innovation coming uh, into a community that has very diverse opinions on it. Uh, and, and I'm kind of um, kind of curious where that's all going to go. Yeah, I agree. It'll be uh, over the next um, 10 to 20 years. It's going to be very interesting to see how everything evolves and um, how the industry accepts certain technologies and, and rejects others. I'm very, very interested, especially when you have like like you were talking about just a second ago with THCA, you have these market dynamics influencing some of that, you know, where you've got um, people that are more so maybe now than ever feeling that pressure of needing to find um, 
genetics that are going to ensure that their you know livelihood stays intact um, now that the farm bill's passed, and you know we'll see how it changes over the years. Um, but I know that's why there's you know a big push now for CBG dominant, CBGA dominant yep. uh, cultivars and everything. But they're still getting THC um, in some of those. Um, so it's interesting, and this this starts to segue into some of the research I wanted to talk about. But before we get into all of that to set up a good foundation, can you describe a little bit of um, some of the tools and techniques that are used to study DNA and kind of uh, keep in mind that some of our listeners don't have any background with any of this. So, oh, kind sure. of, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So um, there's there's generally two different types of um, DNA sequencers that are out there. There are, there are sequencers that are used to resequence a genome generally at much lower cost uh, if the genome, if, if a reference genome is already known. Mm, gotcha. So uh, let's say like we've, we did the human genome back in 2000. Um, it wasn't really finished and still isn't finished today. There's still some centromeres that haven't been fully sequenced yet, but you know, 99% of the genome is known. There's a large effort trying to make sure we have maps across all the telomeres and centromeres right now. And they've managed to diverse a couple chromosomes from, from telomere to telomere. Um, but once you have that reference genome, uh, since the human human population is fairly inbred, uh, we differ maybe by one in a thousand letters in the genome. Uh, what that means is you can use a much cheaper sequencer to resequence other people's genomes and then just compare it to the reference. Mm-hmm. Um, and these are this is usually where Illumina comes into play. They can only sequence about a hundred bases of DNA, maybe out to three hundred. Um, uh, some extreme cases they can do paired ends or six hundred base pair reads, where they do two three hundred base pair reads aimed at each other. Uh, and that gives you, um, it's a, it does really well in the human genome. You can remap and, and, and sequence people's genomes for probably under $500 now. Um, that doesn't include all the analysis, but just the raw cost of the sequence is getting close to, uh, close to that point. Um, now, with that said, when you're resequencing and you're mapping to a reference that is fairly representative of the entire human population, uh, you can f- figure out where all the single letter changes are really easily. It's a bit more challenging to figure out where entire chapters of the genome are missing with those technologies because the, mm. when the read gets shorter than the size of the variant, it's very difficult for those reads to actually detect the variant. So, so as you approach like 25 to 50 base pair changes in the genome, the short reads systems start to stumble and, and miss important genetic variation. Um, so there's been an effort to increase those read lengths, and most of those efforts have it gone in the direction of sequencing single molecules of DNA so that they, they get a cleaner signal. Um, it's very, the Illumina systems right now, in order to read the DNA, they first amplify the DNA to a couple thousand copies. And then when you're sequencing that particular colony, uh, you're actually sequencing uh, a thousand molecules that are all marching in step down the DNA strand. And what invariably happens as you go out and read length, each one of those reactions is probably 99.9% efficient, but over time, they start to get out of phase. The, the molecules get out of sync, and it gets very difficult to start reading the sequence. So to get around that, that synchrony problem, uh, what the, the direction the technology moved was to sequence single molecules, which is much harder to do because you need to be mm-hmm. a thousand times more sensitive. But once you're reading single molecules, you never have to worry about the rate at which the polymerase decides to read the molecule. You just let the thing run, and you get to read the DNA as the thing is copying it in real time. So uh, the two sequencers that are probably most known for this are Pacific Biosciences sequencers, and then um, an upstart sequencer that's, uh, I probably have one floating around here somewhere. Um, it's called Oxford Nanopore. Um, and uh, they, they, they're much smaller footprints, but they're much noisier. These things... Mm. We'll thread DNA through a, um, a, a biological um, protein pore, and it, when the DNA gets threaded through that pore, uh, the current starts to change on you based on the sequence context that's in the pore. So the thing might zip through at 500 bases a second, and as it's doing so, it's leaving a current profile that tells you some information about the sequence. Um, they're about 90% accurate. They're getting better. They're, it's, it's a very quickly improving platform. But the interesting thing about that platform is it's so, it's so small, it's portable. You can bring it to coronavirus outbreaks. You can bring it to Africa. Mm, I see. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, you usually need a hell of a lot more bioinformatics in the back end to clean up the signal. Uh, th- those are um, the, the read length on those are unlimited right now. Um, they have had reads go out to 2 million bases on those things. So it's a massive breakthrough on read length. 
Wow. Um, somewhere that's a little bit more of a, of a compromise between the two is a system that also sequences single molecules, but the way it reads it is using a, um, a zero-mode waveguide, which is basically an array of very, very small holes. And there is a phenomenon when you're trying to image molecules, single molecules in particular, which are very small, is that the, the problem you have with anything that uses light or fluorescence is that fluorescence is actually a fairly large wavelength. Um, yeah. If you look at uh, the wavelength of blue light, for instance, it's 500 nanometers, and you're right. trying to measure things at the angstrom. So it's kind of like shining a floodlight on top of a, a speck of sand, trying to watch the speck of sand. And uh, if you have more than one speck of sand in the floodlight, you really don't know what you're watching. Um, and so what they had to do is, is build um, these tools that focus light into a smaller diameter than the actual wavelength of light. And that's done with a technology you can see in, in the front of everybody's microwave oven. The, a microwave yeah, oven yeah. actually has this remote waveguide there that prevents those much larger wavelengths from, from, um, from getting through. But what happens at the, at, the, at the surface of that, never put your hand directly on the surface of that thing. It won't let you because there's a screen there. But if you were to get close enough to that, there would be a zeptoliter volume of irradiation coming <laughs> through there. And that zeptoliter is enough to illuminate a single polymerase molecule copying a DNA strand. So PacBio mm -hmm. does this really elegant um, device where they read 8 million of these holes at a single time. And uh, they've managed to be able to put circular molecules into this thing. So when the polymerase grabs onto it and rolls and starts to copy it, it runs it around like a gerbil wheel over <laughs> and over and over again. So you end up reading the forward strand, then the reverse strand, then the forward strand. And as you do this 30 or 40 times, you eliminate all the noise. And they now have 20,000 base pair reads that are 99.9% .9 accurate, which is like an wow. absolute remarkable breakthrough. And we've only had that in the last like four months. Wow. wow. Um, so much of the work that you see in the paper we put out actually used a technology of theirs that was a little bit older that was probably 50 fold less accurate, but it had 200,000 base pair reads. We use that to assemble a few of these cannabis genomes. And very recently, we've gone back and resequenced them with this newer hi-fi chemistry that they have um, to even to you know, improve the references even further. But it's those two main tools that I think are first are being used the most in cannabis right now, is that we, we don't have good references. And the human genome is easy in comparison to the cannabis genome to sequence. Um, a, a couple of the, the things that make genomes easier to sequence is that if the mother and the father genomes are fairly similar, it gets they're easier to sequence. And that's the case with humans. In the case of cannabis, there's probably a, a variant every 50 letters instead of a variant every 1,000 wow, letters. So yeah. that's much more difficult to sequence because um, the mother and the father genomes are like sequencing two different genomes that are blended together. Uh, and that can confuse a lot of the algorithms trying to put the sequence back together. So the, the long reads on these platforms, and particularly the long ones that have accuracy, are what are really shining through. They're the ones that are putting the genomes together in, in, uh, in, in perfect order, near perfect order right now. Um, and uh, that's enabling us to start to ask, can we build a single reference for cannabis where we can resort to these cheaper tools for mapping right. reads? And the, I think the work's still out on that. We, we do do a lot of Illumina sequencing. The, the preprint that we have up there has 40 genomes that were done with Illumina mapped back to the reads that were the references that were built with PacBio. But one thing that we discovered doing this is that while there's a single letter change every 50 bases, uh, we're finding there's an, an equally high rate of like entire chapters being deleted. This is what people wow, call okay. like structural variation. Uh, and so that, that um, preprint listed about 58 million single base pair changes mm -hmm. in the 40 genomes that we looked at. But in one of the, the trios that we sequenced, which is a mother and a, and a father and its offspring, mm -hmm. we did that all with PacBio so we had the visibility to see these large chapters being deleted and added. And we're seeing upwards is about an eighth of the genome that's in structural variation between just an inbred cross. Mm -hmm. uh, that's an enormous amount of genetic material that is different uh, just by crossing siblings. Right. So let alone if you step out and cross like a type <laughs> one with a type three, you're gonna. It's probably gonna be even more diverse than that. Um, and it's beginning to beg the question whether we should we should go with the old route like we did with human, where we make a reference genome and map everything to it. It might just be the time and where the technology is mature enough where you just forget the short reads altogether and just always right. use something like that file. Uh, that's a cost question. Right now, PathBio is probably tenfold more expensive than Illumina, so a lot of people want to 
um, want to try and leverage the Illumina platforms as best they can. But um, if you really want to know what's going on, uh, a single SQL chip from uh, PacBio, which are usually a couple grand, you can probably get a trio sequenced on one of those now. Uh, so we, we tend to recommend people uh, in breeding programs, if you don't know where your parents came from and you're not confident in them, at least sequence the parents with PacBio. And then you can do all your F1s and F2s mm -hmm. with the cheaper tools. But if you're starting with a, refer a distant reference, like the ones in NCBI where you don't even have access to the germplasm and they may not even be the same type of plant, mo most of the references up there are type 3 plants, um, you're, you're going to have a bad time. Um, yeah. there, there's so much difference between those references that uh, they're a great starting point, let's say. But um, the, I think the direction the field's going to go is in these uh, toward a pan genome, where you, if you're going to build a reference, it needs to include type 1s, type 2s, type 3s, type 4 plants, so that we have all the industrial um, uses of cannabis in there uh, as a reference, so we're not missing genes. Right, uh, not just focusing on the drug type cultivars and... Right, right. And yeah, or you... the hemp one. Right, right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And can you describe um, really quickly for our listeners, what are type one, two, three, and four uh, oh, uh, cannabis varieties? Uh, so this goes back to Etienne de Meyer's work and probably yeah. Dave Watson's and a few others. They, they, um, they classified cannabis into five categories. Um, these need to be refined, but this is just a historical um, classification where type one plants are THC dominant and tend to have a 23 to one ratio of THC to CBD. Uh, type 3 plants are CBD-dominant plants and have the mm -hmm. inverse relationship. Uh, type 2s have both genes, uh, and uh, they make both THC and CBD. Uh, and as you get into type 4s, they don't have either gene. They don't have THC synthase or CBD synthase, and they, they just make the precursor of Um And uh, it, type 5s are, are broken even further upstream and don't even make cannabigerol. Yeah. Uh, and so they're cannabinoid-free plants. Now, what we've come to learn after doing all the sequencing is that was a remarkable classification system they figured out not having ever seen the genome. Uh, so <laughs> yeah. that they, they figured all this out kind of the old school way with Mendel. So they don't really know or haven't really ha never published where those markers are in the genome. Uh, the, the preprint we put out at least attempted to do the most popular ones that we find. Uh, and the most common mm -hmm. variations we see in these cannabis genomes that map to this nomenclature system are the, the type 1 plants have a broken CBD gene, so they really only have THC synthase there. And whatever CBD is coming through is probably a promiscuous synthesis from the THC synthase gene. These, mm. these genes are not 100% pure. They right. don't make uh, only one compound. They tend to predominantly mm -hmm. make one compound but leak a little bit of the others. Um, likewise, if you look at the CBD plants, they usually have the THC gene completely deleted. Um, and the reason why we think the nomenclature system probably needs some more refinement is that there are some rare cases where you can have a THC gene be present in a type 3 plant, but it has a point mutation in the gene that's mm. deactivating it. Gotcha. But the yeah. gene's still there. Um, and so that can throw off some testing tools. We, we've had testing tools in the marketplace now for three or four years that try to just look for the popular ones, the, the, the full gene deletions, but they're... Uh, they get tripped up when there's a, actually a THC gene there and there's a point mutation that's killing it because the assay is not sensitive to pick up that single case change. Um, likewise, if both of these genes are missing from the genome, uh, there, it's usually a good sign that it's a type 4 plant. And uh, so a lot of people have been using the sequence information to breed for uh, CBG plants right now because when you have both THC and CBD synthases deleted, uh, you have less... Uh, synthase genes that could be leaking THC expression. Yeah, uh, and so the 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 other genes that we're paying close attention to in that in that preprint are the cannabichromine genes because yeah. those are the next closest related genes <clears throat> to THC synthase. And the plant for some reasons made like eight of them. Uh, it has got more of those genes than the THC and CBD synthase genes. Um, they're not heavily expressed in a lot of the tissues we've looked at, but mm -hmm. again, we haven't looked very deep and at. Um, I think to really find cannabichromine expression, you might need to be looking at um, different time points in, in flowering and maybe in veg states uh, to really see it turn on. We, we happen to see the most cannabichromine expression in male plants, and I don't know why. Oh, interesting. Um, yeah, that was the only place we actually got RNA expression in that study were in male flowers. Um, and uh, and the, the Jamaican lion plants that we sequenced have a, a, a cannabichromine cassette. A lot of plants don't even have that cassette. So... Um, uh, but but that's another gene that that people like to keep their eye on if they're mm -hmm. trying to breed 
wider spread between um, uh, a cannabinoid and THC that's compliant with the USDA regs is um, they pay very close attention to the copy number of THC synthase, CBD synthase, and CBC synthase. And that usually gives you uh, some guidelines as to um, how much you might leak. Yeah, yeah. Have you, um, going specifically to CBC just for a second, um, in any of the work that you've done, have you seen any correlations with um, uh, differences in environmental qualities that, that might influence um, CBC in any sort of way. And the reason I ask is there's some old literature. I mean, <laughs> possibly, I can't remember when it came out. It was possibly late 90s or early 2000s, so it could be totally irrelevant now. Um, but it was based on looking at some of the data that was coming out of the University of Mississippi and um, and some of the some of the accessions that they had. They were seeing higher levels of CBC, and there was speculation that it might have something to do with humidity or something like that, given that the plants are grown in Mississippi versus, you know, more arid environments where they normally would be grown. Uh, so that's, it's a really good point. And one thing that, that surprised us in this whole study is after we sequenced um, these 40 genomes, and there's a figure in the paper, uh, yeah, I should point people to in this that may give them a perspective on it. Let's see which one it is. I think it's figures seven, eight, or nine. Uh, what we looked at was the presence of these um, copy number variations. Your audience probably can't see this, but, but what, what shocked us, uh, we'll maybe post it in show notes or something, is yeah. that um, the blue means they're deleted and red means that you have the genes. The Jamaican yeah. lion strains are here, purple, they have their heterozygous for it. But what was shocking to us is that there are all of these different strains out there that don't have this mm -hmm. chromatopromine cluster. And this isn't one gene. This is 2 million bases of sequence that's deleted. Wow. And what's, what's on that contig that's been deleted, or the portion of the contig that's deleted, happens to be three or four other genes that are involved in pathogen response. Uh, there's an aquaporin gene in there. There's, um, there's, there's a few of them listed in the paper. But uh, I, So if there's any cannabinoid that would be most directly linked to environmental conditions and perhaps pathogen response or humidity, I, I would pin it on that one because you can Very see that there's a there's a common deletion in the population that when it's gone, you lose some of these other genes with those cannabinoid synthase genes. And so those plants arguably are either going to be more prone to pathogens or have a different response to stress um, than, I mean, one of them is actually a gibberellin transporter, right? That gibberellin is a really important plant hormone. And right. I, I don't know how, how many more the genome has. I have to kind of go and look at that. But just seeing one of those things get, get deleted um, means the the plant's probably going to have a, a really odd response to stress, and it's in very close proximity to the cannabichromine genes that it, it, you know that 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 might be uh, you know reason to believe that uh, yeah the cannabichromine expression might might be a little bit more linked to um, to these these types of changes. Wow, really fascinating. This is already like making the the uh, gerbil wheels in my in my head spin because that's that's something I've always wondered about and and hearing about this this genetic work is nice because you know with my background looking at the the chemistry of the plant and doing um, testing that sort of thing CBC is one of these problematic cannabinoids where um, if your method is not really dialed in to really um, measure CBC accurately you can get a lot of other compounds that can co-elude around the same time as CBC. There are oh, yeah. isomers of other cannabinoids that show up around the same time. So, you know, something I say to a lot of cultivators and extractors that are trying to get information on CBC is, you know, some of the data that's floating around on your test results about CBC, you can kind of take with a grain of salt. That might be CBC, might be something else. Um, it's right. it's right. one of the, it's just, coming out of the labs, I just know it's one of those problematic cannabinoids that a lot of times is not super accurate compared to, you know, CBD, THC, or CBG even. Um, yeah, well, that's a that's an industry-wide problem in that um, we, we have a hard time as it is correlating some of these genetics to the particular chemotypes yeah. because the, the, we're usually relying on genetics and genetics from all over the world, and but then, you know, chemotype testing that's done in 50 different laboratories that all run different methods, <laughs> and it's very hard to um, standardize uh, and and get um, get results that you believe in, unless you take control over all of that and run it locally. And, exactly. Um, that 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 means you're usually studying plants that are only within your state um, because you can't get the flower material across state lines mm -hmm. legally unless you're dealing with type three plants. So it, it's there, there there's a lot of um, limitations I think to, to the research because of that. And 
And as your other cast have mentioned, we do need to be looking at the flavonoids. Yeah. Uh, can flavin A B and a variety of these other um, cannabinoids that people are starting to find, like the Italians, the THCP cannabinoid yeah. is probably at very low levels in some cultivars that we just don't know about because no one's been looking for it and there aren't standards yeah. for it yet. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, um, you know, cannabis as a biochemical factory is, um, geez, the potential there is is really incredible. It's, you know, um, something I, I also say to people a lot is, you know, if you're a researcher wanting to get into cannabis research, it's an exciting time because there's, uh, depending on, you know, if you can think outside of the box of just THC and CBD, um, there's so much low hanging fruit to pursue regarding research projects and stuff. So there's so much work that needs to be done. Um, and that's why it's exciting. You know, I have mixed feelings about the way the hemp industry is going. But one thing that's exciting with labs needing to get DEA licenses to handle hemp, oh, yeah. um, this yeah. this changes the game as far as labs being able to work with um, like universities um, or even, you know, other labs that have been, you know, kind of slowly trying to do cannabis research on a federally legal level and have, you know, kind of struggled and there hasn't been a strong network of researchers there to kind of support each other. Um, that's going to change a bit. And like already I've, I've done a little bit of work with some universities to help them get um, sort of caught up on some of the scientific literature and get um, some um, analytical methods um, in sort of uh, development and moving towards validation and stuff. And I'm really excited to see what momentum we're going to see when these labs are able to actually move material to one another um, and, and universities are feeling comfortable not risking, you know, their funding and that sort of thing to actually touch cannabis. Um, yeah, and that, that is starting to happen. We're seeing um, Cornell get funding now. We're seeing yeah. Harvard get funding now. Um, but you're right about the DA issue. That That's almost going to guarantee that labs that know the least about the plant are the ones that are put in charge of it. <laughs> yeah, it's a good point, um, yeah. And and, and, and and the testament to this is just look at what happened to Full Spectrum Labs, right? They they were an operating cannabis lab who tried to play by the book, applied for a DA license, and since they were at the time presently handling cannabis, they got raided and shut yeah. down, right? So anyone who's currently right now handling cannabis, uh, they're going to be really reserved to go and apply for a DA license knowing what's happened in the past. That's almost going to invite a, a DA raid unless you set up in a completely new business that's financially untethered mm -hmm. and, and then somehow get your intelligence in there and then apply. It's just, uh, um, it's certainly going to favor pre-existing DEA laboratories. And right. from the ones that I know, they're great at picking up cannabinoids in urine, but they're awful at picking up <laughs> exactly. plant. Yeah. They've been focused um, on toxicology and that's, that's really the only, the only thing they've, they've been really working on. Um, yeah, it's going to be interesting. Um, there's going to be a, a learning curve for sure that um, we're going to have to wade through over the next several years while um, labs get caught up. But yeah, thinking about the long term, I think it's all, um, I mean, of course, I'd rather just see cannabis descheduled and then <laughs> you don't have right, this. Right, and then this is, is <laughs> right. you know, DEA partners to study a plan is kind of crazy. It is. It's, it absolutely is. And that's something I always try to preface is as much as I talk about, you know, part of my job on the side is helping people navigate these regulatory waters. And, and so I talk about it a lot kind of casually, but I, you know, I do like to point out, it's like, I don't want it to be this way. <laughs> I, I definitely yeah. don't. Yeah, but it is. And, you know, and it's what we have to work with until it changes. Um, well, um, so segueing into the, the research that, you know, we've um, been sort of dancing around, let's, let's talk about um, the study that just recently put out. So right now it's in a preprint form. Um, but so there's a ton of data there in this research. You looked at, um, a Jamaican lion cultivar and yes. And yeah, mapping... that was... oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just to say you were, you were mapping the, uh, parents, the siblings, and you were looking at, um, genes related to cannabinoid expression, uh, sex expression, and pathogen resistance. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. And so just to you know, caution all of it, it is a preprint. It's not been through peer review, but all the data is public. So anyone can grab the data and uh, download it and play with it while it's going through peer review. Um, Koji is a great place to go if you want to look at the data. It's a genome browser. Uh, comparative, if you just Google C-O-G-E or comparative evolution um, or comparative genomics um, genome browser, you'll 
you'll see a search in there for Jamaican lion or for cannabis, and you'll see a certified reference up there that has a lot of this data linked in. It's got great graphical tools, so you can you can kind of play around with this data yourself. But yeah, so we, the, 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 the purpose of that project was to first build some good cannabis references. Um, back in 2011, we sequenced a ChemDog strain with the, these short read Illumina tools. Mm -hmm. And uh, those have, we probably did a billion reads. And when you try to assemble those reads, the genome is so complex that you only get like uh, puzzle pieces out that are about 3,000 letters long. This is what <laughs> we call a, a contig size in, in genomics. And you want those contig sizes to ultimately be the full length of a chromosome. It's rare, rare they ever end up that way. They usually are broken up into a couple pieces because the centromeres are hard to get through and some of the telomeres are hard to get through. But um, the human genome has one or two chromosomes after 15 years of being declared finished or done, finally <laughs> tip to tip. So eh, we're going to do much better than that in cannabis. It's, it's going to happen faster because we get to stand on, the, on their shoulders. But um, so the, the, there's, this, there's this term in the, in the genomics field that measures the contiguity of genomes, and it's known as the N50 number. This is the, the average size of the length of the pieces of your puzzle. And cannabis chromosomes are usually 60 to 100 megabases in size, and you'd love for your contigs to be perfect stretches of mm. 60 million bases long. I think the largest one we have in one of ours is 40 megabases, so it's, it's close. We're almost, yeah. we're almost to perfection. But the references we had when we started this project the N50 size, I think the largest one at that time in GenBank was about 150 KB, so 150,000. Mm -hmm. So a big improvement from 2011. Um, and then John Page's group put a few out um, a few days after we released the Jamaican Lion one. They put one out from Purple Cush and Finola, and those inched up toward 400. Um, I think Sunrise put one out that's in the 750 range, uh, 750,000 bases, but the... Um, the real assembly gurus don't get excited until you're over a megabase. Um, that's kind of like a, a, a mental threshold that they want to see before they start considering a reference grade genome. Um, and we still weren't quite there yet. Uh, so we decided to keep sequencing and we just, all that we did different than the people behind us uh, was that we just jumped on board of the newer sequencers. Uh, the latest and greatest chemistry just pushed the Jamaican line reference above the megabase mark. So it's, currently at around 3.2 megabases on the, on the preprint that we put forward. So the average stretch of sequence in there is, is a, a stretch of three and a half megabases long. Um, now, the other thing that's important is looking at the, you know, the quality of the sequence to make sure there aren't a lot of errors. Because when you have mm -hmm. 58 million variants, you don't want to be spending your time on 5 million ones that are wrong. It's a lot of error to sift through. So the, 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 the more later sequencers tend to have a, a lot more... Um, uh, a lot better error rates and, and more accurate data. Now, the other thing that you tend to do to really build a strong reference genome is you like to sequence a trio, which is uh, a cross, basically, a, mm -hmm. a mother, father, and an offspring. And the reason you do that is you can then triage your errors that, that don't make any mm. Mendelian sense from the ones right. that should. We, we call these Mendel errors, and there's less than like a 0.2% Mendel error rate in the, in the Jamaican lion trio that we have. Um, so what that means is you look for variants in your offspring and you say, do I see evidence of this in either of the parent? If it's not either parent, it's probably a sequencing error. And you use that information to basically categorize what variants are real and are wrong. The other thing that usually has to go on when you're dealing with a new species, and, and we're doing some work with this on, on Google and, and uh, a few other parties in the space, is... You usually have to retrain your algorithms that look for the variants when you're dealing with a genome that's as polymorphic as cannabis. All these tools were trained on humans, so they're only expecting yeah. a variant every thousand letters. When they start seeing one every, every 50, 50 bases, yeah. they start throwing everything out, saying this is a different <laughs> organism, get the hell out of here. So you have to go back and retrain all the base callers and all the variant callers to start calling the variants more appropriately. And they usually take the tools um, that are used for mosquitoes. Uh, mosquitoes have a variant like every 20 bases. So they're, probably, they're one mm. of the most polymorphic species out there. Um, and so the tools that they did on Gamby, they can then, Anopheles Gamby, they can then kind of tune to be somewhere between, you know, humans and, and Anopheles and, and, uh, and settle in on cannabis. So we went through the effort of doing that type of training with the tools that we were using. So we get the base calls really accurate uh, and the assemblies very accurate. And then once you have that sort of trio, that reference set, you can then confidently take Illumina data and map it across all of those references and start asking questions like, are there entire segments of the genome missing? Um, what's the polymorphism rate in all the genes that are out there? How many highly damaging variants do we have in a given cultivar? 
Um, in other words, gene like mutations that actually destroy genes. Right. How many of them? There's like over two thousand of those in a, in a given uh, uh, genome. There's that many genes that get wow. obliterated through through um, polymorphisms. Um, once you also have these references, um, the next thing you want to do to curate them is you go and sequence the RNA off of as many tissues as you can. And what that does is it tells you what genes are being turned on right. and where they are in the genome. Uh, today, we don't have great tools that can just scan a reference genome and say, oh, I can see where all the genes are just algorithmically. They really want to see biological evidence of how those RNAs are getting written off the genome. So if the listeners aren't familiar with DNA and RNA, mm -hmm. the analogy you often hear is that DNA is <clears throat> like information on a hard drive. And the RNA is what's in your task manager, which programs are actually getting executed off that hard drive. Not every cell in, your, in, in the genome or in, in the, the plant is going to be expressing all genes all the time. Right. Right? You know, a, a, a trichome is going to be expressing a lot of TOC synthase, but it may not be expressing any of the root proteins that are, right. uh, that are needed to, to interact with the, the mycorrhizal. So uh, you, you do this to try and get uh, as many pictures of what genes are on and which tissues. This helps you annotate the genome so you know where all the genes are. And I don't think we're done with that process yet. We, we did this across five tissues. Uh, we found about 27,000 genes in the, um, in the female genome and about 32,000 genes in the male genome. And those numbers are likely to increase over time as people yeah. survey more tissues and, and do more sequencing. Um, one thing that is really um, a bit of a breakthrough that's happened this year in the sequencing platforms is those same single molecule sequencers can now be deployed on RNA molecules. And mm. in the past, we, we didn't really have that. We had these short read sequencers trying to ascertain where the RNA is mapping to the genome. And that's really hard to do because RNA is kind of like a fragmented hard drive. Mm -hmm. It never reads a gene from a, like a, a capital letter to a period as a perfect sentence. Uh, what tends to happen in, in the genome is your gene gets scattered across um, the, uh, the genome in like 10 different pieces, uh, almost like fragmented data on a hard drive. And there, there are tools in the cell that when you make that RNA transcript, they go and splice out the regions that are the mm -hmm. exons and make what's known as a, a transcript. And it, the process of, of excising those exons, it can do in a combinatorial way. So you can have uh, any given gene through a process known as alternative splicing of that RNA can make you know three to 10 different proteins. Uh, so the protein complexity is not a one-to-one -one correlation with the genes that are in the genome. Uh, but having these sequencing reads that can read across the entire gene, so genes RNA in one shot, means you can accurately place all of those exons back under the genome. Wow. Uh, we haven't had that in cannabis until until this year, actually. I think we were the first people to probably put out any PAC bio RNA isoseq mm -hmm. data that gave us really clean information on intron and exon boundaries. Um, that's a, that's something that's really hard to do with short reads, particularly in very polymorphic mm -hmm. species. Um, it's it's a bit of a challenge. So we now have that that um, backbone inside that Koji browser. We can see where all the transcripts are um, in mm -hmm. five different tissues. Uh, and then we also started to play around um, with methylomes. Um, this is the epigenetic code, and it's never been mm -hmm. done in cannabis before. Uh, it's very hard to do in cannabis because cannabis, the genome is 63% AT. So there's, there's four bases in, can in, in, in most genomes, A, T, C, and G. And the human genome has roughly an equal amount of all four letters, making it a, a fairly easier genome to work with. But as the genomes skew their, themselves more in the direction of one nucleotide pair or the other, it's kind of like putting a jigsaw puzzle together where all the pieces are the same color. Um, yeah. You end up having less entropy and signature in each of the pieces, and so you find yourself confused more often. Well, when you want to do methylation analysis, you have two choices. You can use some of these single molecule sequencers, but they're not good at doing it in plants because plants' mm -hmm. methylation patterns are far more complicated than microbial ones. So you can hit microbial or maybe human methylation patterns with the single, the single molecule sequencers today, but they don't handle plants very well yet. So we had to resort to a tool um, that's known as bisulfite sequencing. This is something that will convert the DNA uh, if it's not methylated into it. All, all the cytosines in the in the genome, mm -hmm. if they're not methylated, they get converted into a, into a T, into a different base. And so by sequencing this before and after a, um, a conversion like this, you can figure out all the, all the cytosine bases in the genome yeah. that are protected by the methylation mark. Uh, however, the genome goes into something like 88% uh, AT. 
it becomes so AT rich <laughs> that you yeah. can really you get lost trying to put the reads back into the genome. You can only like map half of the genome back with this tool. But it's the only thing we've got today uh, to handle methylation. And so we we ran that on four different tissues to get an understanding of where all the promoters are in the genome. The promoters are the regions in front of the genes that mm -hmm. are usually responsible for turning the gene on or off. Right. And when they're methylated, they're silencing the gene. And when they're unmethylated or hypomethylated, uh, they're turning the gene on. And yeah. so uh, we've got beautiful pictures now of THC synthase and the adestin gene, which is involved in um, some seed development. Those methylation patterns getting turned on and off um, of DNA. Um, one reason why we're excited about this is it does give you a, um, it gives you better paleogenomic tools. If you ever want to look at ancient cannabis samples, you can't do it with RNA. RNA is one of these molecules that breaks down really readily and very quickly. Right. It's 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 that way on purpose because it needs to make those RNAs to send a signal and it needs to kill those programs afterwards. And so yeah. there's all this feedback mechanisms in cells to to destroy RNA after it's been expressed. Uh, methylation, however, sticks around for a really long time. You can actually pick up methylation signals on ancient DNA samples. Uh, and so it can give you some understanding of what genes are turned on and off uh, across long time horizons. Uh, and so there's, um, th there's an interesting aspect to, to methylation data in that regard. But, um, but th that information is now together and public and people can kind of comb through it. Um, th that was leading to your, I think, your final question, which is, what did we see in this data regarding pathogen response? Right. And on the pathogen response front, uh, we we took a little bit of a myopic approach in that we we looked at all the genes that have been published in hops um, that play a role in pathogen response, particularly powdery mildew resistance, because mm -hmm. um, powdery mildew is a type of pathogen that's very cheap to detect. Um, there's not only PCR assays for it, you can visually see it. So right. you can tell if a plant powdery mildew resistant or not, uh, if it's surrounded by other plants that are loaded with it yeah. and it seems to not have it. Um, that's not the case with a lot of other pathogens. You can't see them, so it's hard to, to phenotype them. But uh, we, So we looked at um, chitinases. Chitinases are enzymes that are throughout mm -hmm. the kingdom, the plant kingdom. You, you, see, you see them in all plants. Um, and you also even see them in fungi. Oh, but that's what I was known, about to say, yeah. Yeah, they, so it's an interesting game. They, some fungi express these to kill other fungi. <laughs> uh, Trichodermis one that makes chitinases to kill aspergillus. So um, it, it's a it's a weapon that's used to fight off fungi because it's the cell coats in fungi are are made of chitin and another molecule known as a beta glucan. Yep. And beta glucan is uh, something plants have evolved to fight as well with proteins known as thaumatin like proteins. Uh, these things chew the other thing that's inside of a, uh, a fungal cell membrane. Uh, so we looked at those two gene classes and then another one known as MLO, which is a mildew locus that was discovered or mildew resistance locus that was um, discovered in, um, in hops and in, in other, other plants as well. But there's some work done in hops trying to map this out. So all in all, that was about 82 genes that we just went through and said, are there any large like copy number changes in these genes that might correlate with pathogen response? And we're starting to find some of those patterns in Jamaican lion. Um, there's a, a handful of thalmatine like proteins that have copy number amplifications that seem to correlate with, path, with powdery mildew resistance. Uh, and there's some chitinases as well that are sticking out. So those have been uh, interesting to look yeah. at. But um, I, I wouldn't say it's the final chapter on that story because mm -hmm. I think we have found the genes responsible for powdery mildew resistance in Jamaican lion, but I don't think you can necessarily apply those to all the other plants out there, because I think there's five to 10 different modes of resistance out there. And we just happen to be looking through the lens of one of them. Right, right. No, that's a, that's a really important point when, when people read this data that it's, it's very fascinating and it gives you insight into this one mode of action. Um, but like we were referring to earlier, there could be, the picture is almost certainly more complex, could be other things going on. Um, so that's, that's super Super fascinating. I um, there's a couple things that I wanted to ask you to define in case anybody's listening and has gotten a little confused. Um, one is, can you briefly describe simply what methylation is to listeners? Which normally yes, my exposure yeah. to it is around like heavy metal resistance in plants and that sort of thing. 
Um, but yeah, just briefly describe um, what that is, put that in context for listeners. Yeah, so um, the ATCs and Gs in the genome uh, faithfully replicate themselves in cell division, but there are other marks, uh, uh, almost environmental memories that get mm-hmm. written onto the DNA. And that they get written under the DNA in the form of methylation. They tend to methylate cytosines, uh, Cs in particular. Uh, there is some methyl A that you see in bacteria, um, but the, the most common um, methylation pattern you see is, uh, is a methylation signal that gets put in the cytosine. Now, there's a couple other forms of methylation on cytosine that I won't get into, but in, in neurons and humans, there's 5-hydroxymethylation, and there's mm-hmm. a variety of other forms of methylation, but it's still all working on the cytosine base, just different methyl groups hanging off of it. Um, but this is usually something that's done uh, to make the DNA coil and to contract. It's uh, When you add a methyl group, it makes it a, a more a hydrophobic um, uh, molecule. It's like adding more carbon to it makes it greasier. And so yeah. the, the, the DNA changes properties. And uh, the methylation tends to also attract other histones and other proteins to it to wrap the DNA and coil it. And a lot of gene expression is based on just uncoiling the DNA, getting these histones to move out of the way, getting the DNA to relax so that an RNA polymerase can come in and, and start to express a gene. So you tend to find the regions of the genome that are getting silenced get, get, get heavily methylated, the cytosines get methylated, uh, and then when they're getting expressed, they tend to erase that methylation pattern. Mm-hmm. Now, sometimes, in rare cases, this methylation is, is, is accidentally heritable. It gets, it gets moved through sperm and meiosis and into, they've shown in rats and mice that they, there can be methylation signals and small RNA molecules that transfer environmental information into the offspring. It's a very, very subtle effect. It's, you need very large end numbers to really prove this, and it's probably a minority of the heritability that's going on in genetics, but it's fascinating. It's, yeah. it's, 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 one, of these, it's one of these things that's brought back the debate between uh, you know, Darwin and Lamarck, you know, this, <laughs> right. this whole Darwinian genetics Nature where- Nature versus nurture. <laughs> Exactly. It's, 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 it's back, and it's, it's good that it is back. It's been a long time. Lamarck was <clears> silenced for many years, but the reality is a little bit of Lamarck was right, and uh, that there are aspects of your environment that will get written onto your DNA, and, and a small portion of that may, in fact, find its way into the offspring such that the environment can actually change the genetic outcome in, in, um, uh, in future generations. But um, again, that's, it's, it's a very subtle effect. And, and, and not nearly as powerful as the mutations you might see that are actually written faithfully into mm-hmm. the DNA. Yeah, it, it, the thing that pops up in my mind to conceptualize this um, in a totally different way, my wife is a mental health therapist. It reminds me of the concept of intergenerational trauma. <laughs> it's like, you know, oh, right, these, right, right, these, subtle, right, yeah. these subtle things that can, you know, get passed on um, that relate to, to how, you know, somebody... Uh, grew up and and their environment and everything. But it, it's interesting, and I know we're deviating, but I, I think th- this is something in general I, I wanted to ask you about misconceptions around genetics and and genomics and stuff. So uh, the concept of epigenetics is talked about a lot. It's a very um, it's a big sort of buzzword in pop popular science, pop culture science, and stuff like that. And so I I. One of the questions I was going to ask, and maybe just ask you now, what are some of the misconceptions that you hear kind of popularly shared about genetics, genomics, and and particularly epigenetics, whether it be related to plants or humans um, that you'd kind of like to set straight? So the scientific field is really excited about methylation for the complete opposite reasons that pop culture likes to magnify its effect. Um, the, The pop culture likes to uh, almost guilt people into their actions today are going to hurt some child three generations from now. And that is right. like, such remote garbage. It's, 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 it's hard to hang out on. But, um, the, uh, but we're excited about it because it teaches us about the machinery of, of expression and, and, and the cell. When we see the cell methylating certain things, it tells us, it gives us another vantage point on what's going on. Um, it's mm-hmm. one thing just to measure the RNA that's coming off of these, um, off the genome. It's entirely another thing to have and to know which parts of the genome it's methylating as a result of this, because that implies there's a feedback mechanism, that there is something else in the cell that is responding to a signal to make something transcribe and maybe even a feedback mechanism to turn it off. Uh, And so we like having those circuits all spelled out. So we're really excited about epigenetics for that reason. But a lot of that often gets um, uh, pushed into pop culture as being 
uh, you know, this, your actions from three generations ago are, are now impacting uh, the direction of the human population. And uh, that, that, that's the, there's very, very, very thin evidence for those things. I don't doubt that, there, that, that some of those studies are in fact real, but the Ireland famine is one that, that comes to mind. But mm -hmm. it's such a weak p-value and such a weak effect that um, you, you'd be better off worrying about whether you're, you're staring at your phone too long walking into a street. I mean, it's, <laughs> yeah, yeah, really, yeah. There's, well, there's, there's stronger selective pressures out there that are likely to affect your genetics than, than some of those, um, those epigenetic effects. So uh, it, it's unfortunate, but it happens. You know, the, the science often gets, gets interpreted politically, and I think uh, epigenetics is one that, that has uh, a, a sort of guilt associated with it that's being leveraged politically. Well, yeah, and for people that are not scientists or have a very vague understanding of the research that's gone into this, it can really freak people out unnecessarily. It can cause a lot of stress, like you like you mentioned, um, that that really isn't warranted. And a, another example that comes to mind is you know concern over um, you know different types of waves that are passing through your body, you know. Um, uh, and the effects of gravitational waves and this sort of stuff that some people, um, when they start hearing about, um, oh gosh, like quantum quantum gravity and, and uh, quantum mechanics is a big one where people start to hear these concepts and then they get really strung out worrying about um, these effects of things that, you know, the effects may be real, but they're so small in comparison to other things that have much bigger pressures yeah. on you, like you're saying, that it's like, it's not really worth exerting the mental energy to worry about that when you're already, you're, you have much more real um, issues to deal with that you, you probably don't have to worry about, um, you know, d wave dis gravitational wave distortions being caused by, you know, comets and things moving through, yeah, right. you know, the galaxy. Um, Strung out is a great way to describe uh, string theory. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, so going, going back to the, the research study now, so, well, I guess one thing I want to summarize for listeners too, just to kind of talk about some of the techniques and the things you've described. So we, we talked about basic um, DNA sequencing, and that is looking at the possibilities, essentially, of the organism, what's, what's there, the foundation to work from. Um, measuring the RNA allows you to understand what's actually at play um, within that DNA yeah. sequence. And then the methylation piece, being able to look at that, helps you understand how the environment is influencing these things that are at play. Is that a, a good, super yeah. simplified version of explaining that? It is. That, and, you know, methylation in many ways is, is, I actually like the RNA data better because there's uh, so much more information content yeah. there and it's, a, it's more accurately mapped. But the methylation is, is kind of another confirmation. Yeah. Uh, when you see uh, promoters... Uh, have methylation patterns that promote the expression of, of the genes. You um, it, you have more confidence in actually what's, what's going on. So it's just another it's another view onto the genome. Um, but yeah, that's that's effectively the central dogma, right? Is, yeah. is we have this genome. It is the hand that you're dealt, and if you don't have certain aces in that deck, you're never going to get them, no matter how much mm -hmm. light or water you put in that plant. So if you don't have a THC synthase gene, you're not going to coach that plant into making THC some other way. Yeah. Um, However, if you do have a THC synthase gene, it, the gene doesn't necessarily predict that you're going to make 7% versus 14% THC. Right. Uh, at least that gene doesn't. We, we're hunting down a couple other genes that, that are uh, related to the precursors in the pathway that might, in fact, have a bigger impact on the magnitude of expression. But right now, the genetics between THC and CBD, they really just give you the ratio yeah. to expect. Mm -hmm. But they're not going to give you, uh, if you push the magnitude of expression of a given ratio too far, it will break the, the USDA regulations. Right. And the genetics today aren't going to predict that. Um, uh, I think in a couple of years, we'll know that. We'll know that mm -hmm. there's a couple of genes up, 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 up um, stream that everyone's looking at um, that are involved, the AA3 and AA1, and um, there's a lipotolic acid cyclase and uh, mm -hmm. parental transfer. There are all of those things are, are great candidates for mutations that may in fact be driving the magnitude of expression between a 7%er and a 14%er. But you know, if you have a 14% CBD line, uh, you're going to be risking that popping hot. Um, it's going to it's going to probably approach that 0.3% under the given regs that are there. And so a lot of people are unfortunately trying to find 7% lines, grow twice as much material, mm -hmm. only so the material 99% of it ends up going into an extractor yeah. where the ratio no longer matters. It's um, right. it's absolute vanity by regulation. But 
uh, it's what's there. Uh, but to the point of your analogy on cards, um, you know, if you're missing both aces, CBD and THC, you're going to be, you're going to be making the precursors, the, the yeah. kings, if you will. And, uh, and that's a, the, so the genetics can be very, very predictive and they can be predictive at a very early age. Uh, and they can also scale. Uh, that's one thing that I don't think everyone yet appreciates. While they probably are never going to give you uh, and, and never going to be a replacement for an HPLC value, mm -hmm. um, you're, you're probably never going to have a field portable HPLC that can run thousands of samples a second. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that will be doable with genetics. It's just a matter of time. Um, but it, 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 uh, it's much harder to imagine getting that to work with an HPLC system that, that's field portable. So. Um, so they're complementary, and uh, we always encourage people not to view them as one versus the other mm -hmm. because there are many more things that you can measure with genomics, and its price points are changing so radically you should pay attention to it. But they're always going to be complemented by people who have good analytical testing equipment. Yeah, no, I think that's a, an excellent way to summarize that. It is all complementary, and even within analytical chemistry, there's sometimes a, a, a strange um, competition between analysts that prefer um, kind of traditional chromatography and those that like to rely on mass spectrometry. And you've got um, some people that are very resistant to, you know, they kind of want to stick to chromatography and, you know, and that's what they do. And others like really trust um, spectrometry. And, and then, I mean, obviously, I mean, they blend together. You, you use mass spectrometry oh, as, yeah, yeah exactly. Um, but there is a, a funny, there's, you know, within the science world, there are these weird little camps and tribes just like anywhere else where, yeah, you yeah. Know. And they exist in sequencing too. We all bicker over what's the better platform to use. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, are there, any other lessons that um, that you gleaned from this recent research project that you want to talk about? I mean, one thing we mentioned, but I don't know if we really got into it, was the relationship between these um, cannabinoid acid synthase genes and the pathogen resistance. Uh, we touched on oh, it early yeah. on, but I don't know if we really got into it. Yeah, so um, the ongoing debate in the field is what is responsible for residual THC expression in plants that don't have a THC synthase gene? Yeah. Why are, why are hemp plants popping hot? Um, and the number one culprit for that is CBD synthase. Um, whenever people clone that into yeast and, and run it, they tend to get like 20 to 1, 23 to 1 ratios of, of CBD to THC. So the gene in yeast will make promiscuous THC. Mm -hmm. um, you can alter the pH of those, of those conditions and even get those genes to make all the other cannabinoids. Yeah. Um, in fact, there's a there's a really good presentation. I'd recommend people look at. Um, it's a CanMed presentation from this October from Andrew Horowitz from mm. Demetrix. Demetrix is a synthetic biology company out of Jay Kiesling's laboratory, and uh, Jay Kiesling is well known for cloning a lot of the plant genes into bacteria and in and, and and into yeast. And this this freaks a lot of people out, but there's actually really good science that you learn when you isolate a gene into a model organism mm. like that is you can perturb it in isolation of all the other cannabinoid genes that are in the cannabis genome. You take one of them out and put it into yeast, and then you can play with the pH and, and you can play with the temperature and all these other conditions, feed it different precursors and see what happens. And what they did is they fed those yeast hexanoic acid and they got THCP. Mm, so they actually yeah. found THCP before we found it in the plants. <laughs> yeah, the, the Italians discovered it very recently, but if you actually go through the literature, you realize, no, they were making this in yeast, and they learned that the synthase genes in cannabis that we currently have, if you feed it octanoic acid, will make THCP. Mm -hmm. So we don't need to go be looking for a different THC gene. It's the same gene will fold THCV and THCP. We need to be looking upstream, maybe in the pathway that's, that's governing what makes hex hexanoic acid and what makes octanoic acid. Mm -hmm. So we're beginning to be able to use synthetic biology to teach us about the plant. Um, we did a very similar thing uh, in, in this study in that we took a couple of the genes that we saw were related to pathogen response, and we cloned them into E. coli. Uh, we took a, a thaumatine-like protein uh, that was amplified in the Jamaican lion genome and also amplified in a couple samples that we got from Colorado Seeds and from Minibus, Mark um, Jordan's group. And those ones... Uh, we put into, into E. coli, and once we had, excuse me, that cannabis gene getting synthesized in E. coli, we can make gobs of it and then apply it back to microbes that we know infect cannabis, like Fusarium mm -hmm. and Aspergillus and Pathosome, and see if that peptide actually kills those microbes, at least in a Petri dish. 
And we demonstrate some of this in the paper. It's not killing, uh, we don't have evidence that, that the TLPs, the thalmatine like proteins, are, are killing aspergillus, but we do see that it's, it's retarding the growth of penicillin species and of, of Fusarium oxysporum. Um, the next experiment we have running is grabbing the other gene we found that was correlated with this resistance, which is a chitinase. Uh, we have that getting cloned in Express Nicoli as well. And most of the plant literature shows that if you combine these two, you get a better uh, uh, one plus one equals three mm -hmm. effect. And uh, you really can knock down um, the microbes once you have both of them present. So we're in the process now of taking those cannabis genes and just making gobs of that protein so we can test out the theory is, are these the proteins that are responsible for keeping cannabis powdery? Are they some of the proteins, I should say, not the only ones that are making yeah. cannabis powdery milk resistant? And can we consider those as like a foliar spray? Um, there's, it, it's, it's one thing to have the genetics and know how to breed for resistance with this particular form of resistance. That's very helpful, but yeah. it might take time. But there are some jurisdictions, particularly here in Massachusetts, where changing your genetics isn't easy. You, you have to kind of run with the genetics you put into the seed to sell tracking system. And if you oh, want to I add see. new genetics, you got to go through a lot of paperwork yeah. with the CCC, and it's a big hassle. So some people are kind of locked and loaded with the mothers they have, and they're looking for ways to fight off these pathogens with native peptides from the cannabis plant, not with some foreign molecule that's going to end up in a vape pen. Yeah. Um, and so we're really excited about that side of the market because we like the idea of enzymatic uh, pesticides because enzymes degrade. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and you can, you can destroy them, and you can get rid of them. So you can use them in a really ephemeral nature. And they're not going to end up like microbutanol concentrating into mm -hmm. a vape cartridge. Um, and we'd rather do this with peptides that we know are from the cannabis plant because the consumers are already consuming those. Exactly. Um, we don't yeah. want to grab something foreign that might trigger an allergic reaction. We want to grab something that has been time tested with human biology for thousands of years. And if it's come out of cannabis, it's probably been through that ringer before. Yeah, that's that's super exciting using using these technologies to think about um, different types of pest management and something that came into my mind then too is you know we've we've been talking about pathogens um, but what about um, genes related in some form or another to beneficial relationships that the plant would have with yes. microorganisms? So the thing that that kind of shocked us that came out of the paper was if you look at the RNA expression um, in the plant, the most heavily expressed genes in the genome are these chitinases. However, um, and they're also the most differentially expressed genes, meaning that the, the, the different RNA, the, the RNA expression is quite divergent between tissues, mm -hmm. but it's completely absent in the roots. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think the same was the, similar with the TLP. So um, why is it not expressing pathogen response to the roots. Well, we think that's due to a lot of the work people have just demonstrated before us, but these mycorrhizal interactions you might have in the root systems, if right. you want to foster mycorrhizal interactions, <laughs> you, you, you don't start off that handshake with a, a toxic chitinase. <laughs> right, yeah. Come on right? in and let me kill you while you're at it. Yeah, so th that's kind of fascinating to us. The roots are not making this stuff, uh, and that's probably to have some type of commensal react, you know, relationship with the, with, um, the fungi that are in the soil. Um, the other thing that was kind of interesting along those lines is that that deletion that um, we see so commonly in the type 1 plants, which is a cannabichromine deletion, uh, it's quite present in a lot of the hemp lines. And many of the, the hemp growers are looking, they're working on breeding programs to cross and, and, and capture that cannabichromine deletion into their hemp line so they can just, we think that's what's responsible for the THC levels that you see in type 4 plants. You'll see some type four plants out there that are like a hundred to one, mm -hmm. and uh, they don't have THC or CBD synthase. So the only, the most likely place that that residual THC is coming from is probably the cannabichromine cluster. And so people are looking to just try and get rid of that, yeah. particularly if it's already known to exist in the population, and we can just do a couple crosses and get there. Um, but in the process of doing that, uh, we have to pay close attention to those other four genes that are on that that deletion that are involved in pathogen response, uh, because that may alter. You may breed yourself a, a really <laughs> compliant hemp line that is loaded with botrytis and powdery mildew. Um, and, and, and that's a little bit more frightening to us, actually, because the USDA yeah. has nothing in the regs for microbial detection. No, no. You, you can have it loaded with aspergillus, and, <laughs> uh, and as long as it's below 0.3, it's cool. Uh, and that's a bit of a bummer for those who are used, looking at CBD flour for like a, a smoking um, yeah. program. I mean, there's, there's a lot of success in people swapping out CBD for tobacco. 
uh, or swapping tobacco out for CBD. I think Switzerland's been doing a lot of that work. And yeah. uh, that's a much safer alternative, as Donald Tashkin's shown. But um, I don't know that I can say that if it's going to be hemp that mm-hmm. can be loaded with pathogens. So we need to do more work there. That's still just a, a theory that mm-hmm. these genes are missing when you when you select for cannabichromine deletions. Um there's a lot more work that needs to go into proving that those are in fact more pathogen susceptible. We haven't done that work. We mm-hmm. just kind of pointed out the fact that it's a common deletion. People are probably going to breed for it and it's going to come with these genes getting knocked out. But one of those four genes is a gene that's involved in viral response. Mm. Uh, and viruses we know are, we're now starting to be able to detect those uh, with the RNA sequencing data that's been yeah. coming out a lot of the laboratories and, and the discovery phase of cannabis viruses is really just beginning. Um, there's there's only a few that have been that have been really quantitatively nailed, but I think we're going to see ten more in the next two years, uh, and and that's going to change um, you know how we manage those as well. Yeah, I feel like I keep seeing um, like every year uh, since I don't know one or two years ago, I'm starting to see. Uh, or people are messaging me saying, have you heard of this virus that's been identified? And sometimes these viruses have very um, cryptic names because they don't have a name. It's um, like, yeah. I can't remember the name of one, one I came across. One of called um, cryptic, cryptic Cannabis Virus. Yeah, one and two. yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah those, exactly. Those, yeah. Are, uh, those are in NTBI, and I can't, the, the, I, I don't know. We, we made assays for those. We've never found them in cannabis. Uh, and yeah. it's probably just, it's very rare. The, the challenge with, our, with, with the viruses is that, uh, it, they're usually RNA based. Sometimes they do, right. they're viroids and they don't even have a, a protein shell in them. So they're very susceptible to breakdown, uh, which means it's unlikely they're going to make it to your laboratory intact um, yeah, yeah. across state lines. And, and very few people want to hang out for that experiment that, you know, you, you, if they think they have a virus, they torch it. They don't yeah. they, and let's put it over here so you can play with it. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a bit to ask saying, Hey, can you save that one for me and, and ship it across state lines? Um, so uh, what usually means is you've got to teach people how to do RNA extractions in the field so that you can get something that's converted into mm-hmm. DNA or is in, on ice and can survive the shipment to a laboratory. And we're just not there yet as a community. We're still getting some of those tools out to the masses so that people can do on-site RNA preps. But um, the ones that are tightly linked to a, a, you know, a close um, university can probably get those, those studies done. And we're starting to see that. I think Darkheart Nursery did some work uh, looking up the... Uh, uh, that was a viroid. That was a hops latent mm-hmm. viroid. But there was also some excellent work out of Israel looking at a lettuce chlorosis virus. Excuse me. That um, that was they, they actually demonstrated white fly transmission in that paper. Mm. So um, the pest management is actually playing a role because some of these yeah. uh, pests are are actually the vectors for the disease. Um, but we we've built uh, quantitative PCR assays for all three of those for for cannabis cryptic virus. Hops um, latent viroid, or vi- hops, hops latent viroid, mm-hmm. and then lettuce chlorosis virus, um, and we're just in the early stages of working with people to get them to, to test these out. So if you know people out there that are interested in, in quantitative PCR tests to, to monitor that, um, we have the tools. We just don't have the, the grows or the gardens mm-hmm. or the places to deploy them. We need to partner with people to see exactly how to put those things to use. Yeah, I think I think it was the hops latent viroid that someone asked me about very recently, um, and I, I hadn't heard about that in the context of of cannabis at all until they they mentioned it um one thing that i was wondering is is there any way to test a plant sort of generically to understand if it um is likely to have a virus regardless of identifying what that virus is because i know a lot of cultivators battle this you know, sometimes viruses appear as like nutrient deficiencies that have very similar yes. symptoms. And I yes. have cultivators that ask me a lot, how do I quickly know whether this is a nutrient problem or a viral problem? So this is actually an industry-wide problem that's not unique um, to cannabis. Mm-hmm. Viruses, um, they, they don't have necessarily conserved sequences that we can rely on to universally capture them and sequence them. So yeah. Um, if you look at fungi and bacteria, there's tricks that you can play. They, yeah, exactly. they all have to have ribosomal DNA operons, right? So you can design primers that will amplify all yeast and mold. You can design primers, or I shouldn't say all, most, because mm-hmm. there, is, there is even some divergence amongst um, primer sites you might pick to try and amplify all of these things. But um, likewise with bacteria, you usually go after the 16S region, and, and that a single set of primers can probably get you everything in, in the on the bacterial side of things. We don't have the the analogous um, 
primer sequences you might target for viruses that mm -hmm. would be conserved across all of them. They're having this problem with coronaviruses right now, that they have to engineer new yeah. assays for these viruses so uh, they can spread them around the world and um, the virus mutates a little bit. So they have to mm -hmm. have multiple different primer sites that target um, the coronavirus. Um, so what people do in the case where they, where they can't use something as fast as qPCR is they resort to RNA sequencing, which just captures all of the RNA that's present, uh, sequences that, um, sometimes they'll try and deplete the really common um, ribosomal sequences that are in the RNA so they get more efficient sequencing, but it's, it's, another, it's another expensive step. Um, and then they blast that all through, through DNA, a DNA sequencer and then filter that information for sequences that look like they're from the virus. Um, so there's some, several viral databases out there that you can leverage that will scan your RNA sequencing data for, um, uh, for virus content. But, you know, that's, that's expensive. That's, mm -hmm. you know, you're, yeah. you're talking about hundreds to thousands of dollars to do studies like that. So it's not something that you just do on a whim. Um, and so you find yourself in is the scenario of doing lots of tests for individual viruses of suspect. Now, um, I've not seen tobacco mosaic virus uh, ever show up yeah. genetically. I've seen people say they have it due to some pictures, right. but I've not seen it actually show up in a test that proves it was that. It's probably something very related, but not exactly tobacco mosaic virus. It's probably a hops mosaic virus or something. Yeah. Um, and there's a few of those that, that, have, that have been listed. So uh, it does make for um, uh, a bit more cumbersome of a test. How they handle mm -hmm. this in human clinical studies is they tend to have uh, multiplex tests that look for a panel of rhinoviruses. Uh, so mm -hmm. the, and they, and they, maybe they, they first scan, uh, you know, 20 or 30 of them with qPCR and then, uh, depending on what hits they get, they might, they might do narrow, um, it down. narrow it down to some other, some other ones. So, uh, that's at least what they're doing with the coronavirus. They have a, a test that looks at, um, a handful of cold, common cold viruses, rhinoviruses and nor and, and nor type viruses. And then if they see it's negative for all of those, they, they graduated to maybe a, a, a SARS or, or a coronavirus test. So I, we'll yeah. probably see something similar like that in cannabis is there'll be a, a two-step screen. Mm -hmm. And if you really need to know because you're, it's plaguing your entire grow, you might graduate to doing a DNA sequencing and RNA sequencing to, um, to thoroughly figure out if this is something novel that's not never been seen before and, I, and you want to crush it. That's, that's usually what you do. Yeah. Yeah. Fascinating. I know that's probably, um, yeah. Uh, I know growers want that easy sort of detection fix, and I'm sure it's disappointing to hear that it's just not there. Um, but I I know many growers that have tried to battle with <laughs> what they thought were nutrient deficiencies for far too long, um, trying to battle what, what actually ended up being a virus and, you know, just wasted a lot of time and everything. And my response is usually like, if you're really worried about it, just can you just torch that plant and move on? Um you know, rather than wasting so much energy and time. Um, and some growers are now getting to that point because their fields are so big now, they're not worried about saving a single plant or a handful of plants. Right. So right. they're able right. to just cull the ones that seem to be causing problems and move on, uh, which would be more typical in um, bigger forms of agriculture. Um, moving, uh, changing gears um, quite a bit. What are your thoughts on how genomics research is going to influence cannabis taxonomy in the future? Because that's that's a really muddy area yeah. in general. Cannabis taxonomy is one of these things that nobody, I mean, even, you know, botanists and um, chemists and geneticists, it's hard to get on the same page on how to classify plants or even how to define what a species is. Um, but where do you yes. see that moving towards in the future? So we're in this weird time frame where the entire phylogenetic tree of, of life is getting redefined. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and so I'm kind of waiting for that dust to settle before I weigh in because it's <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, there's plenty to do it genetically, which is if you're 95 percent identical to this other microbe, you're the same you know genre or the same species. They're trying to make make um, metrics like that to begin calling these, and it is needed because we have a lot of redundant nomenclature even in the microbial um, side of things. If you try and get aspergillus species out of ATCC or other cell banks, you'll, you'll find that a lot of them haven't been sequenced before. And then you apply primers to them from the literature yeah. that are supposed to hit them and they don't. And then you sequence its genome and realize it's not what they told you it was. Yep, yep. Um, so a lot of this stuff has all been, been done with eyeballs, people looking at the morphology and looking at these things on plates. And of course, 
organisms can express really bizarre phenotypes. I mean, mm -hmm. the, the classic case is, is like a caterpillar and a butterfly, right? Mm -hmm. Same genome, complete. You wouldn't, if you looked at those things, you wouldn't call them the same species. Right. Uh, if you look at Aspergillus species, they can be just as genetically diverse, uh, yet they look identical. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, the, the look of the, of the species is no longer trustworthy for classifying them. Now, speciation in general usually involves um, whether they can continue to cross. Mm -hmm. Right, we have cannabis plants that all cross with one another, so yeah. they're arguably the same species. Now, if you want to subdivide them into subspecies indica sativa and all that, that's um, that's great. But we we probably need some paleogenomics to really nail that. Um, if that's in fact the story that the indicas came out of one geographic region and mm -hmm. at one point in time, um, and the sativas were more equatorial, then maybe that will bear itself out. But right now, they've been so mixed uh, in in um, uh, inappropriately named during that mixing process that that the, the sativa indica thing doesn't measure doesn't match up to any of the genetics right now. Yeah. Um, so I I, um, I I usually don't get involved in a lot of the debates and whether we're going to call these things chemovars, uh, cultivars, or strains. I tend to mock them actually because mm -hmm. I I, um, I I don't find a very productive conversation when the whole tree is getting rewritten. We can argue over yeah. uh, the taxonomy uh, stuff later. I tend to just read the DNA because that's the answer you're really looking for. What you're looking for in this categorization is how do these things differ biochemically? Mm -hmm. uh, and so chemovar is a great name, but it doesn't, right now the chemovars we're measuring aren't really measuring the flavonoids. So mm -hmm. uh, I, yeah. I don't view that as a legitimate way to necessarily draw the taxonomy. Um, uh, but ultimately it's the heritable units uh, that are, that govern the taxonomy. That's uh, taxonomy is DNA. And anyone who tries to tell you other words is going to be proven horribly wrong in time. Yeah, and no, I think that's really important to point out. I remember when um, in some of my early graduate work studying mycology, how frustrating this issue was of learning um, the taxonomy of, you know, different fungi. And then tomorrow it changes because just like you said, there would be some genetic work that's done and they realize, oh, these things that look identical, even under microscopy and everything, they seem the same the spores look the same have same ornamentation but they're different genetically and now we're, we've got to call them something else so students everything you learned wipe your brains <laughs> like you know yeah, now, yeah, we're, yeah, we <laughs> now we're we're changing uh changing the whole system and and even botany too um you know i was i was a botanist with the uh the blm for wild bureau of land management um scouting oh, awesome. native native plants around Oregon and everything. And I realized um, it, it had been a while since I've gone back and looked at, um, you know, the scientific names of a lot of the plants that I worked with. And um, so just, just a few months ago, I went and looked and saw that about half of them that I was studying that had already gone through um, like genera changes and that sort of things have already gone through changes again and been reclassified <laughs> um, and split and everything. And so it's just a headache of trying to keep up with all this stuff. Um, there, and it, it's, there's an, to, to give you a sense of the, 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 the wave of headache that's coming even further, uh, there, the last study I heard, I think was in the UK, they're going to sequence a million species. All right. <laughs> yeah. So once that happens, everything <laughs> that you've learned, you got to rewrite. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, it's, I mean, we see the Aspergilla species are getting renamed all the time. Brasiliensis yeah. got, got carved out of, uh, out of Niger. So um, I have no doubt it's going to happen in this field, but I, I, I guess I've been advising people in cannabis just stay tuned and be patient because this is the wrong time I think to fight over those those terms, uh, mm -hmm. because we're just in the earliest stages of sequencing everything, and once we have a map of like a hundred thousand different cannabis mm -hmm. genomes, I think we'll have a picture, and we probably aren't going to try to force that picture into sativa, uh, you know, indica yeah. antiquity. Uh, we're, we're probably going to say okay, the autoflowers are over here, and the the, right. the genotypes that have these types of clusters are over here, and it, it'll be named in a, in a coordinate system that's probably more related to large segmental uh, duplications or deletions that are related to its diaspora around the planet. Yeah, I agree. And I, I think the main thing, you know, any listeners that are banging their heads against the wall about what how to talk about cannabis varieties, um, you know, the main thing is to think about, like, what are you trying to communicate in the first place and, and what do you care about? And that can sort of drive your vocabulary a little bit. You know, if you're 
if you're looking at cannabis varieties and you're trying to understand chemical differences, then talking about chemotypes and stuff could be valuable as long as you understand that that's a, you know, a a tool for us to communicate things, not necessarily some hard coded taxonomical Legend. structure. Yeah, yes. exactly. Yeah. yeah, I think that's important in science in general because it's very rare that science drives to a consensus. We want it to. Yes. Yeah. But yeah, uh, I mean. They, they, I think they changed the definition of the kilogram last year, right? So they did, yeah, is, they did. Yep. Yeah, you know, so you're like, oh, shit, <laughs> that can change? Um, <laughs> right, So yeah. like, I thought that was like tied to some astronomical unit of the wavelength of light or something. I yep. didn't realize yep. it was ever going to change. But they do, and consensus, hey, there was a consensus against marijuana for 80 years. It was pretty successful. Right, uh, yeah. And, and clearly that's in, the, that's in the, 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 the latest stages of changing today. So, um yeah, I think you're right. It's it's all, it's about communication, and sometimes the communication that's most popular is probably technically wrong. But if your goal is to communicate, yeah. think the most amount of people that will understand what you're saying. Sometimes you just use the language that's that uh, that conveys that yeah. most simply. I think that's probably the case of what's happening with strain. No one likes that name because it's a microbial mm -hmm. term. But if yeah, you exactly. you know if you do a Google Trends on strain versus cultivar or chemovar, there's right. no one talking about cultivar or chemovar. Uh, everyone's talking to continuing to talk about strain. So if you want to effectively communicate to large audiences, sometimes you have to use those terms. Um, the reason people put things in Latin is because it's a dead language and the language doesn't change. Yeah. Uh, and so we, we don't yet have chemovar or cultivar necessarily in Latin. I think cultigen might be technically a combination of an acronym of, of Latin mm -hmm. terms, but um, it's uh, uh, I think it's all about making sure we have, you know, we have communication and not necessarily hard fix religion, because if there's one thing we're going to learn in the next few years is that whatever we're saying in this podcast today will probably be, be partially mocked as being wrong yeah. in, in a few years. Yeah. I mean, um, there's two things that come to mind there. I mean, one is um, I've always been a fan of Richard Feynman and his work, uh, particularly like as a science educator. Yeah, um, yeah, I love that guy. Yeah, he he did a lot of great work for science education in general, much less, you know, the physics side of stuff he worked on. But something he talked about in one of his late books called uh, The Meaning of It All, and he talks about the, the problem with science education in our culture is that most lay people expect that what science does is it produces facts. And it produces, you know, and those facts, yeah. everyone can yeah. form a consensus around them because they're facts. They are known. They're hard, you know, objective truths. Um, but the reality for people that are, you know, actively doing research and, um, you know, diving into all this stuff is you realize there, there aren't a lot of hard facts, if any, and consensus is harder than you would expect, depending on what you're trying to get consensus over. And what Richard Feynman said is that ultimately what science does is it gets at answers to questions. It may not necessarily provide you the hard answer, but it, it you know, gravitates towards the answer. And it's always moving towards that answer, even if it doesn't quite get to that very yeah. specific yeah. hard truth. But when you talk to people, uh, like, for instance, on a political stage, and you're talking about, let's say, climate change, People want oh, yeah. to know. People want to know the facts. They don't want to know that you've got some general idea of where the science is moving towards, and you know they don't want to hear about probabilities and confidence intervals. They, you know, they just want to know yeah, what yeah. what's the state of things and what do we need to do. Um, yeah, and so yeah. when a when a politician is willing to just assert solid, bold, you know, flat claims, um, people resonate with that because it's a lot easier to digest than the actual muddiness yeah. of science. Yeah, no, it's very true. It's very true. It, it gets weaponized oftentimes. It into, does. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, my my view on this is they they only separated the church and the state so that they could replace the church with people <laughs> in white robes versus black robes. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And now the scientists are propped up as some kind of priest that can read the code of life. Yeah. Um, and everything that comes out of their mouth is is ironclad truth, and we're going to drive politics off of that. And that's that's nothing could be further from the truth. Is yeah. what really is happening? In science is. We're generating questions, not answers, most of the time. Yeah, yeah, exactly. No, that's a that's a great point. It's it is generally about trying to figure out what are the better questions to ask, and then that drives what research you're going to do and and how you're going to approach a question. And um, Isaac Asimov, another um, writer, science educator, you know, even though he he wrote a lot of um, fiction, he had a a paper that he wrote in response to someone criticizing a statement he made about um, 
you know, uh, basically kind of like what you said just earlier that, you know, in 10 years, everything we're saying now, a large part of it is going to be, you know, mocked at and thought of as wrong. You made a statement like that and someone said, well, you know, if that's the case, then, you know, does that mean that um, essentially um, a lot of things are wasted and that anything could be overturned at any time? And he was like, well, no, no, no. Like, what that means is just that our understanding gets sharper over time and it feeds off of what came before. It's not that what's going to come after is going to be totally, you know, irrelevant and in total opposition to the science that's happening now. It's just going to keep pressing forward. And I think the example he used was like the, um, the spherical nature of the earth and how, you know, eventually we learned that it's not a perfect sphere and that it's, you know, sort of like a lemon in a way, you know, it has, you know, this sort of oblong nature to it. And, and it even kind of like wiggles and moves and, um, and, you know, before that it was assumed that, you know, the earth was, was flat. Was flat? And, <laughs> you're right. Yeah. You know, all these things. And so just pointing that, you know, these, these aren't total overhauls of what came before, but they're, refinements and you know it's like getting the uh clarity tuned up even more as as things go on i think that's important for people to understand that you know what we're saying is not that all this is just getting thrown out and that you know a lot of scientists are essentially wasting their time but that you know we're all standing on the shoulders of everyone that's come before and people 10 years from now are just going to have a very different set of eyes than we have now yeah i mean that's to me, that's probably the most compelling um, argument I've heard in this climate debate is that um, the number of ideas that are human generated are, tend to be cumulative, mm-hmm. like they're, they're this idea bridging. And so the fact that we had twice the amount of population back when Einstein was around or, or Edison mm-hmm. or, you know, um, you know, Pasteur, right? Pick, you know, if you did population control because you were concerned that we weren't going to be smart enough to figure out how to use things more resourcefully, um, you would have picked off, you know, Einstein or uh, maybe, maybe Pasteur. And then where would the world be if we only had electricity and not the germ theory of disease, right? The (laughs) the fact that we have, uh, that we had the population we had back then, uh, we are so much more richer and more um, resourceful today than, than we would have been if we actually choked the population back then. So, um, I, I think it's in a really in, in important, it goes back to the concept of humans not necessarily being a, a cancer cell on the planet. We're mm-hmm. actually part of this thing. We have to learn as much as we can about it so that we don't, uh, we don't unwisely use the resources that we have. But um, ingenuity is, um, is very important. And I think the evidence is pretty clear. If you look at people's standard of living and if you look at people's income, they tend to become more environmental as that goes up over time. Uh, yeah. it, it, a lot of the environmental damage is done due to poverty and more yeah. people are moving out of poverty than ever before. And so we actually have a really bright future that we won't hear about in the political sphere because yeah. that's about selling fear yeah. uh, that we're all going to die tomorrow from coronavirus <laughs> and, and uh, tsunami or something. But uh, I think uh, I'm very optimistic about the fact that um, the population is going to be fine, that I think we're science is going to be it's exponentially building upon itself. Yeah. And we often underestimate that that fact. I mean, just now we're in the first generation of people who have access to all information knowable yeah. on their phone. Yeah. Right. Like school is now irrelevant. No one wants to say that, but it is. Right. right? If you're if you if you like to read and you're curious, you don't need school. You need your phone. Um, yep. And no parent wants to say that to their kid. But uh, we didn't have that when we went to school. We had to go to yep. centralized campuses where all the information was literally stacked on paper into in the yeah. library so that in microfiche so we could comb through the stuff and be near the people who are smart and who already read it. But now we can be near those people in conversations like this. And, yeah, exactly. uh, and we have all the information created. That's going to radically change uh, idea generation. Yep. And and it's going to radically change um, people's access to capital and the ability for people to grow and to invent and to mm-hmm. become more resourceful with, uh, with the, the limited amount of resources we have. Um, and I think it's really exciting that cannabis is like emerging from prohibition during all of this because yeah, yeah. we now have probably one of the most resourceful plants on the planet where people have been restricted from being able to really adequately study it. And now the gates are open and we can study one of the best photosynthetic organisms we have uh, that can literally feed, you know, feed the world with this thing. Yeah. Uh, so there's a tremendous amount of potential, I think, for solving a lot of these climate um, concerns people have. I think just by, you know, doing what we do so well with hemp. 
Yeah. Uh, learn this thing, figure out its code, figure out how to tweak it, figure out how, how it interacts best with the environment. And that's going to be a combination of not its genome, but also the microbes that are mm-hmm. in the soil. Yep. Uh, and the more we can learn about that, we're probably not going to come to consensus about what it all means. But as Feynman's saying, we're going to be pushing ourselves in the arc of being more and more efficient with, with what limited stuff we have here. Yeah, yeah, man. Yeah, that's such a, a great summary to bring this whole conversation back around. Um, I really appreciate how much time you've been w- willing to spend with me. We've been going for almost an hour and 45 minutes. I have a, a couple wow. <laughs> a couple of uh, closing questions for you to, to cap us off. One is, um, what other research interests do you have beyond cannabis? Um, I usually like to ask every, every scientist I interview that question. Uh, so I'm really interested in... Um, other pathways that uh, are in its neighboring plants lately. So mm. I've been looking a lot at the, the um, and also this concept of xeno, xenohormesis that um, uh, you, your, uh, your previous guest, uh, Kevin Spellman, will probably have a lot to say about it. But um, so uh, hops has a similar pathway that makes terpenes, mm-hmm. and it makes a different set of compounds that might, I, I would probably call the analogous medicinal compounds in hops are the uh, is xanthohumol. Okay, humals. yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. And and those compounds are starting to show anti-cancer properties, much like the cannabinoids. Um, we don't know really what receptors they hit and, and why, mm-hmm. um, but uh, everything that's needed to make those compounds uh, has some homology to the cannabis genome. Yeah. It's possible the cannabis genome could be making some of those compounds as well. Um, I don't know if it's it's going to need to be crossed into it or how right. that would how we would we genetically engineer it, but it's something that it makes you turn back and look at all these other plants that we've taken for granted and start to ask, well, what are the secondary metabolites in those plants? Because yes. the only reason we've paid so much attention to to <laughs> cannabis is that one of them has a really easy bioassay to tell you when you're getting something. Right. It's THC. Yep. We don't have that in 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 hops. We might have beta carotene, which is a CB2 agonist, but you you probably can't really feel that unless you're in pain and you take a lot of it. Um, so all these other compounds that we can't really perceptually feel, yep. uh, we need to go back and look at because they've been uh, the the FDA system is is selecting against these things. Yeah, uh, and in many ways, the the regulatory environment we have here in the United States favors um, large, largely capitalized companies that can then pay politicians to limit the, the regulatory space of the operators, and so the genetics tend to go through bottlenecks in those environments, and we end up having massive genetic shifts because of regulations. Um, yeah. And so I'm I'm somewhat fascinated about the impact of regulation on genetic drift because I think that mm. there's genocides going on all over the place uh, as a result of this. This 03 percent thing is going to create a massive, just like prohibition, yeah, create yeah. an enrichment for type one genetics and probably a depletion of a lot of type threes. This 03 thing is going to have the opposite effect. It's going to end up meaning we're going to have to select a very narrow set of cultivars to move forward that are compliant with the USDA, and it's going to wipe out all types of diversity we don't know yet because. The, those selections arguably are going to wipe out these other secondary metabolites no one's measuring. Right. No one's going to be measuring the canflavin pathways in the yeah. process of doing these selections. I mean, we, we are, we have sequencing that looks at that pathway, but very few people are necessarily going to jump on that train right away. Um, so the process of even putting in microbial regulations in place, um, this means plants that like and enjoy a particular microbial background are going to get eliminated from the population. Yeah. Right. Let's say you have a plant that needs trichoderma. Trichoderma is not harmful. Yet some of the regulations in some states don't have CFU language, right? Colony mm-hmm. forming units are they're right. they're in yep. they don't know what the hell they're counting. They're just saying exactly. you know bugs, bad, right? It's it's really really um, uh, ignorant uh, uh, for to, to think of micro, microbiomes that way. So when you put that in place, all of the plants that can get through regulation then go through a genetic shift, right? Yeah. You, you get the selection for plants that tolerate low microbe environments. Well, those may not necessarily be the most productive plants from a secondary metabolite standpoint. No one's looking at that. They're just looking at maybe THC and CBD, but all these other flavonoids might, might be abolished in the practice yeah. of, of doing that. So I'm kind of curious at, at seeing where that's, where that's going. But um, the xanthohumol thing and the xenohormesis is just this, this concept that these plants um, are making these secondary metabolites uh, to communicate to the things that propagate their genetics, right? So uh, if you were to actually look at the number of cannabis cells and the number of genomes that are dividing throughout space and time, there's probably a good argument that it's winning that race compared to humans, that we are propagating Mm -hmm. more cannabis DNA right now than human DNA. Uh, 
yeah, because of the nature of of how big some of these plants can get, how big their genome is, the fact that they replicate every every like you know twelve weeks, and humans right. don't replicate that quickly, um, means that some numbers I've drawn out suggest that yeah, the cannabis genome is actually done a remarkable job finding an ideal pollinator um, that mm-hmm. likes to propagate it all over the world. And how did it do that? It did that by being able to make secondary metabolites mm-hmm. that tap into our biochemistry uh, to tell us that changes in the environment are coming or, or what have you. Um, so this work is all done by David Sinclair. He's a guy who does a lot of work on the Fountain of Youth uh, and uh, resveratrol mm-hmm. and many of these compounds that are involved in that pathway. But uh, he's got a great paper out there um, called Xenohermesis, and it talks about how these plants when the environment changes, they shift the secondary metabolites they make so that the things right. that eat them, their their mTOR pathway gets triggered so that they start going into caloric restriction because the plant's biochemistry has changed to know that the environment is going to change and it's going to have an impact in the amount of, of, of material that it can feed the, the, um, the thing it's supposed to propagate. Wow. Genetic. So that whole interaction space, I think, is the key to cancer. And if we can understand how those plants are signaling the metabolism of the things that propagate their seeds, we will understand cancer in a much better way uh, and a much more thorough understanding of cancer because usually cancer is a scenario of your own genome having a, a metabolic defect going on in the subpopulation of the cells and that the, that metabolism is getting triggered and it's usually because of uh, an acidic or a, you know, a different environment, a mutation that's happened. Uh, and the things that seem to be having the most potent effect on our, um, on our cellular metabolism are the vegetables and the plants and the foods that we eat. Right. Um, and that's what we need to better understand to really understand cancer. So um, I kind of like that intersection of, of plant metabolites and, yep. and, and cancer. Uh, it kind of touches home for us. And uh, it's uh, it's a field that um, I think our myopic focus at the FDA is constantly deteriorating because they have this um, – reductionist approach of looking at single compounds as opposed to symphonies of them. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we're at a stage now where we, we have the tools to look at symphonies. Um, they just don't fit into their, their trials very well. Exactly. And, yeah. uh, and we need to rethink whether mm-hmm. the trials are the right way to do medicine. I, I happen to think they're not. Yeah. Um, that you can get a hell of a lot more power out of a study with 100,000 to a million people connected via observational trials on digital equipment like we do with peer-to-peer yeah. networks in 5,000 or 10,000 people in a, in a trial that is a, a subsampling of statistics to the point where you end up with Vioxx-like compounds that escape that process. Yeah, I mean, and, and not to mention the way that the clinical trial system is set up right now, it, it creates such a high barrier to entry to even try to, get, to it, get through that yeah. process, you know? Yeah, it, it literally kills people, and there's no one willing to look at the you know the scene and the unseen here. It's like okay, the fact that a drug takes five hundred million dollars and you know ten years to get through, <laughs> has anyone done a survey on the number of people that died waiting for that drug, right. knowing that it's available in Europe and it's available in Australia? Other countries have deemed it safe, but not here, and those people don't have the money to travel there to do it, so they sit here, they wait, and they die. Yeah, uh, and there's people who study this, and it's a large number of people every year. The Independent Institute does a lot of work on this called, um, and their FDAreview.org. It's worth reading because they go through all of the scenarios where drugs that were approved in others in other countries, so they pass, uh, yeah. you know, at least other countries' criteria, and eventually passed here, but three or four years later, and they count the number of deaths that occur because of this. Um, and no one's responsible for this. No. Uh, and the, you can't vote them in or out. And I think they regulate now like 25 cents of every dollar. Yeah. So this is something that is, um, I'm t- totally terrified that it's going to come into the cannabis space and somehow yeah. um, make the same mess of this space as it did the opiates. That being said, there's a lot of good scientists that work there that yeah. have yeah. all the right intentions. And they are trying to put genetics into all the programs. They're trying to build blockchains to track all the food. So they, they've got all the right vision. I just think they don't recognize that um, it's too big of a problem for one centralized organization mm-hmm. to solve. Uh, and it's too prone to regulatory capture and corruption. That yeah. um, They shouldn't set up that honeypot. They should somehow decentralize it and have competing agencies that can perhaps um, uh, uh, invent different ways of regulating. Because uh, right. it's, it's certainly an important feature of, of a marketplace to have regulation, but not necessarily in the way that it's getting done today. Yeah, and I mean, I also find it kind of funny that, um, you know, a lot of times uh, drug approvals, approvals get so hung up on needing to prove a certain level of safety, sometimes to kind of an extent 
absurd extent. I mean, right now we're seeing this with CBD right now that, you know, with so the liver talk stuff. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. And, you know, and, and not acknowledging the nuance around, you know, some of that research and everything. But what's interesting is that the actual efficacy of a lot of pharmaceuticals that actually make it through the process are not that effective, you know, maybe for 20, 30% of the target population, they may be effective. Um, right. Yeah. And, and they have terrible safety profiles. Um, and so it, it's, I don't know. It's a it's a weird dynamic that the the safety profile of a lot of these natural products that people want to research and try to understand how they can be elevated out of the realm of sort of, you know, this alternative medicine sphere and try to understand like what they're actually doing and how to actually, you know, legitimize them as medicines. It, it's very challenging, um, even though the safety profiles of a lot of these things are pretty well understood by this point. Yeah, and the I think the other big hang-up they've got is uh, there is this gold standard, um, almost religious consensus, as you mentioned before, on double-blind placebo-controlled trials being yeah. the only path to ensuring safety of medicine. And I think that's being fundamentally challenged by, uh, if you look at the, the work on what governs the placebo effect, it starts pointing back to the endocannabinoid system. Yeah. Uh, and so it, there's actually papers out there on on the endo, endocannabinoid system being involved in the placebo effect and analgesic, right? So yeah. how do you put cannabinoid through a double-blind placebo-controlled exactly, trial? Exactly, yeah. If the placebo effect, we think, is 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 people's reactions, their, their ECS, their, yeah. their, their reduction in anxiety is caused probably by anandamide or something. That when they take something, they're taking control of their problem. They're, they're taking mm-hmm. action, and that action gives them confidence, and that boosts their anandamide levels maybe. Right. And, and so – the, the very pathway that you're trying to interact with <laughs> is what's involved in the placebo pr- process. So yeah. I, I think that's just all going to create noise and we should be looking at very large observational studies that, mm-hmm. that we can enable now with these digital t- tools that we have. Uh, and that's probably going to give us a, a far faster and more, I mean, back up and just look at the vape crisis, right? Right. Yeah. So this is a COX-2 inhibitor, um, uh, can, you know, CBD. A lot of people are vaping CBD, sometimes mm-hmm. THC, and they both have analgesic effects. And so I throw them into that category of Advil and ibuprofen yeah, replacements, yeah. Right? maybe even Tylenol. Tylenol is, in fact, an endocannabinoid magnetic, mm-hmm. which makes AM404 with a, a shitty liver metabolite. But uh, so people are vaping these things probably because they like getting a little relief from some pain and, and some fun. Um, that took the field probably 10 months to resolve, right? Because everyone was sharing information. Rumor came out of this, this company's making crap. This one's got <laughs> bad vitamin acetate. Ideas are flying. And with all of the networking we have, there's a, a crisis that was affecting maybe 1,000 to 2,000 people. Right. There was 9 million vape pens sold a month, right. 90 million, maybe 100 million over the course of the year. And we only had an incident rate of 1 in 45,000, right. effectively. Um, now, there's, there, that, that's one piece of uh, arithmetic that's important for how, quick, how, how frequently we sample for these contaminants in cannabis. We're not sampling nearly deep enough to find right. a, a frequency below. So even if we were testing for vitamin E acetate, I'd argue we still would have missed it. Because the frequency of, of this creating a problem is so low that you need to up mm-hmm. the sampling rate you do in the industry to find it. But that being said, can roll it back to Vioxx, right? Vioxx went through, probably killed 50,000 people, and it took the FDA five years to finally admit they were wrong, uh, right? Yeah. And, and why is that? Well, because uh, admitting they're wrong after they were paid <laughs> a lot of money by the pharmaceutical industry to put that drug through is harder to reverse, right? Yeah. It's, it's just... More eat, it's more crow to eat than you want. Um, and many people don't realize the FDA right now is governed by the PDUFA Act in 1992, which means about half to two-thirds of the revenue going into the FDA comes directly from the companies mm-hmm. that they regulate, right? This, this is a <laughs> way of a defraying... Funny system. Yes, it's a, it's a euphemism for bribery. Um, yeah, right, yeah. It, it's uh, effectively, how can that agency with a straight face claim that they are out for the consumer when they're on the payroll of the mm-hmm. people they're regulating? Uh, this is going to lead to really bad decision making, even if it has the right intentions. Um, the, the incentives aren't there. When they make a mistake, they're going to get a bigger budget. Yeah, you know. So th- this is this to me is like we don't need this near cannabis. The cannabis hasn't killed anybody. So what is the the, the FDA? What they've already done to cannabis, if you just look at epidiolics, has made it thirty times more expensive. Yeah, made it an isolate put in the strawberry flavoring yeah. uh, that is registered as a pesticide by the EPA and then added in like sucralose, which like gives yeah. people seizures. Yeah, I mean, right. They made it into a worse drug by, and, and, and GW has to kind of unfortunately put up with this. Right. And, and GW is filled with people who know yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that 
know the the extracts are are more effective, but they can't get something that complicated through. I mean, they got Sativix through, but they haven't gotten it through Not in the our US. system. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so if it does, isolate DVD. Right. Yeah. I mean, um, Ethan Rousseau and I talked about this in our interview and and a little bit off interview too. But you know, the fact that. Uh, they're struggling so much with Sativex and that if Sativex does make it through the U S system, it's, it might end up being a very different uh, pharmaceutical altogether than what you would find in the UK or, um, or in Spain or um, things in Canada too. Um, and it, it, it is really interesting. And I, I agree. I mean, I've been following GW for pretty much since I knew about, you know, knew about them in, I don't know, long, long time ago in the, early 2000s or something. And, um, you know, I've followed the work of several of the different scientists that have come and gone that have, that have worked with GW. And it, I agree. I mean, it seems like as far as I can tell, they understand the, the best way to actually apply these medicines. I, I, some of the research they've done has actually highlighted, you know, that, oh, these, yeah. <laughs> that these extracts, the yeah, um, yeah, yeah, but they're having to play the same regulatory games as anyone else, and um, you know, it's it's so common, especially in the cannabis industry, for people to bash anybody that is perceived as you know a a dastardly pharmaceutical company. And GW, but hey, they write the rules. They they got to play by them. You know? Right. So I don't blame. Them. Sometimes they write the rules when they're really big. I don't think GW is at that scale. No, but. no, they're not. And that's something I try to remind people of. Uh, you know, is uh, one. They were doing this work in other countries initially where they were able to do things that they can't really do here. And some of the um, products, I mean, Sativex in particular is actually a very impressive product when you think about it. It's not, I think there's a misconception that it's isolated THC and CBD, but it's not. It's, well, it's, it, it's a standardized, yeah. yeah, it's a yeah, standardized it's a extract. Yeah. And um, yeah, Ethan and I and were talking an about extract. how. They do actually a really good job measuring. They're measuring things that the labs are measuring. Right. Like they, I think they're measuring sterols, a host of these other compounds yes. that are, we're not seeing in the dispensary. So they have, with hands down, the best manufacturing process for this that, that there is. I don't, I don't exactly. doubt that one bit. Yeah. But they're getting asked to make, they're getting asked to point that amazing scientific engine they have in the wrong direction. Right. You know? but, like, but, but tell us, what's the active? <laughs> yes. Yeah. It's like, they're all active. <laughs> right. Yeah. 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 So it'll be interesting. I mean, you know, I would love to see in the United States some process for getting um, herbal medicines approved as, you know, legitimate standardized medicines. And, you know, now we have like, um, what are they called? Like medical foods that you can get prescriptions for that often are usually just imported from other countries. But uh, the example I always use is like standardized ginkgo biloba extract that you can get a prescription for. And it has standardized amounts of, you know, certain chemical constituents. Um, but it didn't go through the, you know, it wasn't produced in the US. And it, it, it you know, it's an interesting process to even get it to be um, allowed to be used the way it is in the United States. And it's just one of those things that I think a lot of people don't realize that there are alternative ways of determining what is a medicine and how to give people um, access. And then a lot of countries have do have some pretty decent ways of handling herbal medicines. And this isn't a complicated problem to figure out. It's just a bureaucratic and political problem uh, to figure out in this country. It is. And unfortunately, I think it's that same process of... of um, you know, politics and bureaucracy that are forcing these really odd distinctions between medicine and food. Yeah, I mean, yeah, food yeah. Is medicine and, yeah. And uh, it's all chemistry. This concept of, of like recreational versus medicinal I, is to me is like mind boggling that <laughs> that people don't recognize that uh, you, if you do the recreation, you won't need the medicine. It's it, it's uh, right. they're one and the same. It's just when you get into a chronic state of disequilibrium, you might call it medicine. Right. But <laughs> yeah. But uh, that that distinction is is purely political. Uh, and it comes, I don't know where it comes from. It comes from some hatred of people getting high. And yeah. um, yet they happily to have, you know, Bud Light commercials all over the Super Bowl. So, <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. It's a, yeah, it's a strange, strange uh, uh, state of affairs. Interesting, interesting um, time and, and place in history that we find ourselves. Um, hopefully it evolves in a, uh, in a more favorable direction in the future. Um, I, I don't, I, now we've already gone over two hours, so I'm beyond ecstatic that you've been willing to talk to me for this long. 
Um, I want to give you a, a final platform here. Um, let people know how to learn more about medicinal genomics. Also, one thing we didn't even talk about, but is Canopedia. Um, so where people can actually explore some of the um, genetic data and even some chemotype data that medicinal genomics and, and other groups have been bringing together. So I'll just kind of give you a platform here to let any, any of our listeners know anything that we haven't covered and where they can find out more about your work and, and everything else. Yeah, so um, medicinal genomics, we, we make, uh, in addition to doing sequencing for, for folks in the industry, we make a lot of tests to look for different genetics in the plant. So THC and CBD and, and XY testing, we make assays for um, testing those markers. Uh, we have markers that look for fusarium and powdery mildew, and basically all the microbes that might harm the plant, mm -hmm. and also all the regulated microbes. So we sell a lot, a lot of um, quantitative PCR kits into, the, into many of the labs that measure aspergillus and salmonella and E. coli and those things. Um, uh, so that, that you can find in medicinal genomics. Um, the sequencing work, uh, there's a lot of it put public on a site called Canopedia. A lot of people don't know that we run that site because of the way it looks, um, but that's, that's a medicinal genomics site for posting a lot of this um, sequencing data. Uh, it's serving some purposes for, for research and also for IP. There is um, mm -hmm. a blockchain component of that that will etch the timestamps that your data is generated into a ledger that we can't control. So if we ever uh, become evil on you, mm -hmm. uh, you still have your data recorded somewhere else. Um, and that's all managed at, at the Canopedia site. And then thirdly, we do run a scientific conference every year called CanMed. So um, if you're interested in more of these topics, uh, there'll be many people presenting there. Um, last year, we had Raphael Machulam, and uh, mm -hmm. he, he's, he's come most years. I think this year might be a little tight for him because he's, uh, he's getting to the age where it's hard to make that travel from Israel. But, um, uh, but other folks of his caliber, we try and bring in and, and have um, scientific discussion around uh, crop yield. Mm -hmm. um, how do you breed for better crop yield? How are we going to handle um, appellations is one thing that's mm. coming up that we think is really important for the cannabis field so we don't turn into a monocrop in the U.S. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and then we're also hitting analytical chemistry labs and, and, uh, and genomics topics. So um, submit your abstracts, take a look at it. It's usually, this year it's going to be in Pasadena down at, at, um, uh, at the Pasadena Convention Center. I think it's at the end of September. Nice. But uh, uh, it's usually around uh, 800 to 1,000 people. Oh, nice. That's awesome. I'll have to keep my eye on that, see if I can make my way down there. I've, I've, I've never been, but I'm also not, I'm not a huge, I don't know. I, I tell people I'm kind of a, a hermit, um, doing this podcast and starting to like finally get out in the world has been a, a big challenge for me. I've got to like get out of my cave more, um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, trying to make it to, uh, more conferences regularly and CanMed's one that I've had my eye on a lot just because of the caliber of people that usually show up there and, and the, the, mm -hmm. um, you know, sort of higher level of discussions. It's it's one of I've wanted to to make it to. So I have to try to try to get down there. Um, well, um, thank you so much, Kevin, for for coming on and chatting about so many topics. I've really really enjoyed it. Um, keep me updated on any um, big uh, moves that you guys make or any new um, you know publications like this preprint that um, you shared Absolutely. with me. Anything like that, and if anything big comes up and you want to come back on the podcast to talk about anything specific, just let me know. I'll be happy to have you again. Absolutely, Jason. Thank you for the time and uh, keep up the great work. I love hearing these uh, podcasts. I was, I was running out of things to listen to. Now yours is, is on. <laughs> oh, oh I, I view that as a great compliment. Thank you so much. Yeah. All right, yeah, everybody. Great. Thanks so much for tuning in and, and listening once again. If you want to learn more about Curious About Cannabis, you can go to cacpodcast.com. Or you can find us on social media. We're on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Um, and we also have a YouTube channel now. And when we're able to get videos of interviews, we get those on there. And I've also started doing some um, like site reviews and uh, book reviews and that sort of thing, or at least um, editing some of the video that'll come up pretty soon. So check all of that out. And as always, please tune in next time. I really appreciate it. Thanks so much. Stay curious and take it easy. <laughs>